You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's single, my hate and nothing better. Put on the road, I just win. I know we got a million dollars, the devil that's it, and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the third part of What If Naruto Finds Ikigo in Kanoha? Special note, this fanfic is written in the masterpiece of Zionia Aka Disturbed on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Lee spotted Ikigo weaving through the busy foot traffic of the market and promptly flipped out of his upright push-ups to flash him a beaming grin. It was the second day after the attempted kidnapping. Ikigo had joined Lee and his team yesterday and this morning for early practice and had agreed to meet again after lunch. He was still in his training uniform but, from what Lee could tell, was looking much more relaxed, which was a relief. It was good to see Ikigo finally settling into Kanoha. It had been most distressing the other day in the Hawkage's office to realize he thought himself expendable. Afternoon, said Ikigo with a nod. Ah, well, Ikigo's conversation skills had yet to improve, but one could always hope. It is a most glorious day, confirmed Lee hoping to inspire his friend. I see Khan has not joined you for our excursion. Ikigo shrugged. He went to the hospital to see Karin. He said watching you guys kick my butt at hand to hand managed to get old. Privately, Lee suspected that Ikigo was holding back quite a bit when it came to Teijutsu, especially after the display with the kidnappers. But then, perhaps Ikigo was concerned about hurting them if he went all out. He still had yet to spar again using his Bakken though he still carried it everywhere. It was a thought to share with his team later though it would do little to soothe Neji's pride. Your fires of youth burn higher with each bout, cheered Lee. You improve with each bout, which was true and a little frightening to watch. Ikigo never hesitated when he struck, and he when did hit, well, Lee thought of it as using the best strike possible. Ikigo was not dedicated to any one style, but instead used whatever worked in his current situation. Lee had been astonished to some of his own moves from their very first bout used against Tenten. Ikigo had even used one of Neji's gentle palm strikes to knock a kick off course in his bout with Guy Sensei though he had not been able to apply the devastating chakra strike to a Tenketsu point. The whole thing reminded Lee strongly of his first Chunin exam. Uchiha Sasuke had demonstrated similar skill when replicating one of Lee's attack combinations. But Sasuke had possessed the natural advantage of his sharing and while Ikigo was simply that good. Though Ikigo claimed no such title, Lee suspected he was a natural combat genius along the lines of Sasuke, Neji, and Hadei Kakashi. Ikigo looked vaguely amused. Thanks, so Karin and Yuzu are both well? Asked Lee. Ikigo snorted. Yeah. They both collapsed after dinner. Neither one is used to this sort of training. But Ikigo was used to training just as hard and possibly harder. The thought lay fallow between them. So, were you doing push-ups on your thumbs just now? Asked Ikigo to fill the silence. Yes, said Lee grabbing hold of the subject. I promised to do 200 push-ups before you arrived, or else I would run 10 laps around Kanoha. I only reached 158, so I must set aside some time later. Usually that sort of statement prompted eye rolls from his fellow shinobi. Instead, Ikigo cast a longing look toward the wall surrounding Kanohagakure. Outside the walls, he asked. His tone was very nearly wistful. Oh dear, Lee almost flailed in his arms in panic. That was not the response he had been expecting or wanting. The route outside the walls is longer and more useful for training. But should you desire to fan your inner flames by running, I must suggest in the inner route for security purposes. Right, said Ikigo. His shoulders slumped. Only a tiny amount, but as a person trained to utilize and know every aspect of the body, Lee saw it. That was distressing. Ikigo hadn't looked so unhappy when kidnapped. Angry, yes, disappointed. No, do you have some issue with the noble wall that defends our village? Asked Lee. He was truly curious. Even if he wasn't a spy, he was still a shinobi. Information was their life's blood. The only place I've been with a wall like that is Serete, said Ikigo. Serete, repeated Lee. The capital of Soul Society, said Ikigo. The place my father was born. The place Ikigo and his sisters were fleeing, as far as Lee could tell. Well, that was most unyouthful. He certainly did not want Ikigo to associate Kanoha with a place like that, even if it did have an intriguing name like the Court of Pure Souls. Your own village did not have a defensive wall, asked Lee hoping to buy time for his team to arrive. Surely, they would have a suggestion. Ikigo blinked in surprise. You mean, Kurakura Town? No, I mean, why would they? 
There hasn't been a war on Japanese soil in almost 50 years. Lee's jaw dropped. No war. In 50 years, the hidden villages went to war every 10 to 20 years. There was still a silent truce after the end of Fourth Shinobi World War, but everyone knew it would not last forever. 50 years without a war was unimaginable. How different the world must be beyond the elemental countries. But you've had training, said Lee. You fought against Soul Society. Ikigo gave him a look that was hard to interpret. Part of it was sorrow, and part was pity. A couple of times, yeah, said Ikigo blandly. I mostly fought for Soul Society. Those wars were different. Shorter, for one thing. And most people don't know they happened. That was different from the wars Lee knew. Most of the wars between the villages went on for years, and they were all but unavoidable. For all that they were shinobi wars and supposedly secret, everyone was affected from the lowest villager to the greatest daimyo. Lee, my student, what surprise has Ikigo gifted us with today? Dai Sensei had appeared. Tenten and Neji trailed along behind him. Lee felt his world slide back into focus. With his team, he knew how the world should work. Still, Lee wasn't sure how to answer. How would Gai Sensei, who had seen the end of the Third Shinobi War, so much different than the Fourth, react to the idea of 50 years of peace? Lee said mentioned he had to do 10 laps around the village. I asked if he would be going outside the walls, said Ikigo also skipping the talk of war. Neji and Tenten also looked alarmed, but Gai Sensei only looked thoughtful. While you are under surveillance, the hawkage has not restricted your movements, he said. With a proper escort, it could be a good idea, especially since it is a deviation from your normal routine. Ikigo snorted. You mean holing up in the apartment or wandering aimlessly around the village? Lee winced. It was true that Ikigo had very little to occupy his time outside of meeting with teen guy every day. And, unlike his sisters, he had found no way to apply his previously learned life skills since he denied any desire to join the ranks. That is correct, said Guy. Pay attention, Lee. A change of scenery is often all that is needed to rekindle the fires of youth. Yes, Guy sensei shouted Lee. He turned wide eyes on Ikigo. What do you think? Can you make it ten laps around the village? Lee ignored the groans from Tenten and Neji. They always complained about his training regime. But for something as simple as a run, they would be more than capable of keeping up. Not to mention, the slouch had disappeared from Ikigo's shoulders. It shouldn't be a problem, said Ikigo with a wry twist to mouth. As a group, they moved away from the busy city center toward the outer walls. Team Guy fell into a loose formation with Guy at the head, Lee in the center with Ikigo, and Neji and Tenten at the back. If Ikigo noticed they were deliberately surrounding him, he gave no sign. Lee, as always, kept one ear open for Guy sensei as he illumined Ikigo with the many virtues and dangers of the forests around Konoha, but he could not help but overhear the conversation between his other teammates. With Ikigo around, I thought we might finally have a team activity that didn't involve training, said Tenten. Neji snorted, a rather inelegant sound from the normally composed Hyuga. It's to be expected. He's the only person to train with Guy sensei and Lee and come back for seconds. Other than us, you mean? Teased Tenten. Obviously, said Neji with a sniff. We're non-optional. Lee couldn't decide whether to roll his eyes or smile. Naturally, he decided to smile. The springtime of one's youth should be spent on activities that one enjoyed. Training with his teammates was Lee's favorite thing to do. Why wouldn't Ikigo agree? But he was pleased to hear, once again, that deep down Neji felt the same way. Once outside the village, it was easy enough to find the track Lee used for his training. It was harder than strictly necessary, perhaps, and Lee had had to practice many times before he could complete the circuit on his hands as he often promised. But Ikigo had proven to be quite athletic and should have no trouble at all. Indeed, halfway around the circuit Ikigo confirmed Lee's opinion aloud. Ten laps will take forever at this rate, mused the redhead. Oh, asked Lee, do you think you can go faster? Ikigo opened his mouth to respond but paused and looked back at Guy instead. The Jounin looked amused. If you desire to race, then it should not be a problem. If you encounter trouble, we shall catch up soon enough, said Guy. Not if we catch you first, said Lee. Let's go. He took off his an excited whoop and was pleased to see Ikigo fall and step beside him. Neji was generally too dignified for such displays, especially with Tenten about to watch and Guy Sensei's age was slowly catching up though his experience more than made for his lessened speed. It was good to have someone to race against again. Lee upped his speed just a hair. He was delighted when Ikigo kept pace. Every few hundred meters, he pushed just a little more until they were almost flying. He had not honestly expected to lap his team with Ikigo in tow, but after their sixth circle of the village they finally managed it. The expression on Neji's face when they passed by was priceless. Halfway through the eighth lap of the village, Ikigo suddenly dropped out of sight as they leaped over a clearing. 
Li quickly turned around and searched out his friend. Ikigo was standing in the center of the clearing bent slightly at the waist and pressing his palms against his thighs to hold himself upright. He was shaking slightly, and Li was alarmed by the scent of blood in the air. Are you all right? Asked Li. I think I broke something, muttered Ikigo. He coughed and blood burbled between his lips. Maybe a couple of somethings. Li was horrified. We must get you to Konoha at once. No, said Ikigo. He spat out another gob of blood. Just wait a minute. Li frowned. If Ikigo had broken something important, then they should definitely not wait a minute. He was prepared to say as much and haul Ikigo to the hospital if he decided to argue. When the other man closed his eyes, there was a brief flare of dark energy like the kind Li sensed other day just before Ikigo broke his confinement. Then it was gone and Ikigo was straightening up and wiping off his mouth on his sleeve. See, all better, he said. Li gaped. You cannot be all better. You are bleeding internally. What happened? Ikigo blinked in surprise. Who knew you'd be such a mother hen? Look, I was going too fast and broke a couple of ribs. But I fixed it. No big deal. No big deal. Shouted Li loud enough to disturb any nearby animals had there been any. What did you do? Ikigo opened his mouth to explain but quickly snapped it shut and whirled. Who's there? Li looked up. At the other end of the clearing, three unfamiliar shinobi walked out of the trees, two men and woman. They were dressed vaguely alike in dark shades of blue and gray. None had any outstanding weapons that he could see. One man was tall with broad shoulders and dark hair and dark eyes. The other was shorter but just as broad with pale brown hair and gray eyes. The woman had the same brown hair and eyes as the second man and was lean with muscle, which suggested an emphasis teijutsu training rather than seduction. Lee glanced at their forehead protectors. All three bore the symbol of Takagakir, the hidden waterfall village, and all three bore the slash mark of missing Nin. Ikigo, get back, said Lee. These people are missing men and very dangerous. Ikigo nodded moving behind Lee. The Teijutsu specialist hoped his team would arrive soon. Were he on his own, he would be more than fast enough to evade his attackers and rendezvous with his team. Normally, he would say the same for Ikigo, but he had so recently been vomiting blood that Lee was concerned about the result should he try. Hand over the Yuzumaki, and we'll grant you a quick death leaf nin, said the dark-haired man in front. Lee hid his surprise. He knew that missing nin did not go around picking fights with no reason. They could draw too much attention to themselves that way. But he had not actually expected them to be after Ikigo. They were actual missing nin, real, living people, rather than the strange fakes that had attacked two days ago. Lee spared a glance over his shoulder to see Ikigo's reaction to this revelation. He was not afraid, as many civilians would be in such circumstances, but his face had taken on a grim countenance. Lee might have gone to describe Ikigo's stance as resigned, but was distracted by the sight of a cloth-wrapped hilt poking over Ikigo's shoulder. It was not the hilt of Ikigo's bakken because that weapon was planted solidly in the ground a few feet away. The missing nin took the opportunity to attack and Lee found himself dodging a handful of shuriken thrown by the squad's leader. The second man attacked Lee with a kunai while the kunoichi launched herself at Ikigo. Lee disengaged from the close-range attack and crashed into the woman instead. He had never wished so desperately for some skill at throwing weapons. There was no way to keep the attention of all three. None of their attackers had used any chakra yet, so his teammates would not have any reason to hurry. Out of the corner of his eye, Lee saw Ikigo draw the weapon from his back. It was enormous. As long as Ikigo was tall and nearly the breadth of his shoulders at the base, the weapon was single edge and lacking both guard and pommel. The piece of cloth wrapped around the tang was the only grip, but that hardly seemed to bother Ikigo. It looked oddly similar to an overlarge kitchen knife. Ikigo held the massive blade parallel to the ground with surprising ease. Lee was reminded heavily of Suaitsu's Kubikirabacho, the large weapon once wielded by Mamachi Zabuza, one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. You sure you know how to use that kid? Asked the leader derisively. Zenjetsu is a part of me, said Ikigo. The second man snorted. Not for long, it ain't. He threw himself at Ikigo, Kanai extended. Lee couldn't move to help him, entangled as he was with the enemy Kanoichi. He feared what would happen once the missing nin got inside Ikigo's range. A weapon at large could only move so fast. However, it seemed he had no reason to worry. Ikigo moved the impossible sword as quickly as his Bakken, perhaps even faster. He deflected the shinobi's attack and countered in a single swift movement scoring a slash on his attacker's arm. Lee was shocked and impressed. He aimed a punishing kick at the Kanoichi's side, knocking her into a nearby tree despite her attempt to block, and dodged another set of shuriken from the leader. He rushed the man now that he was less concerned for Ikigo's safety but still hoped to the end the fight quickly. Downed, shouted Ikigo. The Teijutsu specialist responded instantly. 
he darted to the side and dodged a water bullet by a hair. Lee had to jump out of the way again as the earth fell away beneath his feet. Courtesy of the Kanoichi, she must have been more resilient than he expected, but landed within striking range of the leader. He hit the man in the elbow, shattering the joint. But the shinobi was determined, if nothing else, and ignored the wound to strike at Lee with a kanai held in his back hand. Lee was too close to dodge completely, even with his speed, and was preparing to take the strike to the shoulder when Ikigo was suddenly there, blocking the hit with the edge of his blade. Startled, the enemy shinobi withdrew to the other side of the field and Lee regained his footing. Ah, oh, my friend, you truly have been holding back in our fights, he said cheerfully. Not really, muttered Ikigo despite having crossed the distance at a speed Lee would find difficult to match even without his weights. I now they have realized, I am not equipped to deal with long-range attacks, said Lee quietly. They will mostly likely attempt to attack with ninjutsu or thrown weapons. Ikigo's eyes were bright even as his mouth twisted into a scowl. It appeared as if he could not decide choose between elation and disgust at the battle. He brought Zenjetsu to a ready stance. Lucky for us, I'm great at long-range attacks, he said casually. Do you think the Hawkage will be mad about the forest? Lee twitched in concern. Ikigo had suffered serious injury only minutes before, and Lee knew of no way to use a sword as a long-range weapon, unless he tried throwing this one too. Part of him wanted to protect Ikigo as an at-risk civilian while the rest saw him as a comrade in arms. Still, they could not hold out forever against three enemy shinobi capable of using ninjutsu. I do not believe she will be concerned, said Lee at last. Good, said Ikigo raising his blade. Lee swore he saw the edge of the sword glowed red. You have more skill than we expected, said the leader. But we will not lose now. The enemy shinobi raised his working hand and began to form a series of seals. Lee was impressed despite himself. He knew one-handed seals required a great deal of skill, even if he could not use them himself. Fire release, great dragon flame technique. The dragon had formed and Lee considered the irony of a leaf nin being killed by fire technique performed by missing taki nin. This technique was all about control. Even if he and Ikigo tried to run, the dragon would follow them. They had no way of judging their enemy's range either. Getsuga Tenshu, shouted Ikigo bringing his sword down in an arc. Moonfang Heaven Piercer, Lee translated mentally watching in stunned awe as a black crescent of pure energy tore through the ground. It hit the flame dragon and consumed it utterly. The enemy shinobi had almost no warning and less time to react. It was a sign of his skill that managed to dodge it although he was not completely successful. Lee stared astonishment when the attack faded. It left behind a deep scar in the earth extending at least 20 meters. The dark-haired leader was lying at the edge of the pit missing one of his legs and part of his previously wounded arm. The other two shinobi were nowhere in sight. Should have known they couldn't dodge it, muttered Ikigo. Lee glanced at him and followed his gaze into the pit. There were the other missing nin, or what remained of them at least. They must have used earth release, hiding like a mole doubtless intending to capture Ikigo and pull him underground while leaving Lee to be fried by the dragon on the surface. The earth shifted, and the Kanoichi tumbled out of her makeshift tomb. Less than half her body was intact, and what Lee could see of her face was surprised. There was no way for them to have anticipated Ikigo's attack or the way it dug into the ground. There had been no great build-up of chakra. Hidden as they were, they might not even have seen the attack that killed them. At least it was quick, offered Lee. It was meager comfort, but from the way Ikigo acted, he doubted this was the first time the other had killed. Ikigo snorted but said nothing. Instead he turned his gaze on his sword. He flicked the heavy weapon up and out as easily as Lee could move a stick. The piece of cloth trailing from the hilt twisted and sinuously wrapped around the blade. Ikigo laid the weapon across his back as any shinobi might sheathe a normal sword. When he let go, it disappeared from Lee's view. Ikigo didn't move as though he had an invisible sword strapped across his back, and Lee was watching very carefully as Ikigo picked his way across the battlefield to retrieve his bakken. Lee could only conclude that it wasn't actually there. If it had been, he or Neji would have hit at least once during one of their bouts. It was a puzzle for later. Lee moved to the leader of squad. To his surprise, the man was still alive. Ikigo's attack must have cauterized the wound somehow. The man was staring blindly at the sky in shock. Lee decided to keep an eye on him and wait for the rest of his team before preparing to move the body. They could hardly be far away now. Lee, Kurosaki, as if summoned by Lee's thoughts, Neji burst out of the tree line followed closely by Tenten and Guy. Are you all right? I am fine, said Lee. But you might wish to examine Ikigo. Neji focused his Byakugan gaze on Ikigo. No injuries. Lee blinked and whipped his head around to stare at Ikigo. The redhead countered Lee's disbelieving look with a challenging gaze of his own as if to say, I told you so. 
Lee wasn't sure if he should be relieved or worried that Ikigo had the ability to heal his own wounds. He would mention it in the report to the Hawkage and let her decide. What in the world happened? Murmured Tenten as she overlooked the scene. Guy's gaze swept over the newly broken ground resting briefly on the dead shinobi and the still living one at Lee's feet. Neji, secure the prisoner, he ordered. Lee, report. Ikigo and I were approached by three missing men, who stated their intentions to capture Ikigo and kill me. I ordered Ikigo to stand back and engage the ninja myself. I was unable to occupy their attention fully and Ikigo entered the fight with a sword-like weapon I did not recognize. We fought to a stalemate and withdrew. The enemy attacked with a fire release, which Ikigo countered with an attack of his own design killing two of the enemy and seriously wounding the third. Is that so? Asked Guy. His voice was perfectly neutral and he was looking at Ikigo like he had never seen him before. Lee looked back at the crater and supposed that it was not an untrue sentiment. He had known that Ikigo was more than a regular civilian. The Hawkage had told them as much if their own experiences weren't enough. But to do so much damage with one attack only the Sanin could manage it or one of the Jinchuriki. Ikigo's expression had slowly closed until he looked as emotionless as Neji on a bad day. I'm sure the Hawkage will have questions of her own, said Guy slowly. But congratulations on surviving. Thanks, said Ikigo voice flat. Incoming, said Neji cutting through the building tension. Naruto, Kakashi, 2ANBU, and Khan. Ikigo grumbled. Karin must have sent them. She was the one keeping Khan today. She sent them. Asked Guy. How did she know something was wrong? Same way they did before. She and Yuzu probably felt it when I released Senjetsu, said Ikigo. Guy opened his mouth, no doubt to ask what Senjetsu was, when the group Neji spotted burst onto the scene. Naruto was in the lead blue eyes wide and frantic with Khan clinging desperately to his shoulder. He was followed closely by Kakashi, who looked grim, and behind him were the two ANBU. Naruto made a beeline straight for his cousin and gave him a once-over checking for any damage. Ikigo, shouted Naruto practically in his face. Are you okay? Karin said you were in trouble. I'm fine, said Ikigo. A little deafened now, maybe. Are you sure? Demanded Naruto. Meji already checked me out, said Ikigo looked vaguely annoyed. I'm fine. Lee was hurt more than me. Naruto whirled on Lee, who mustered a cheerful grin and thumbs up. Fear not, Naruto. I was not injured in the slightest thanks to the actions of your cousin. Naruto turned back to Ikigo. Are you absolutely sure because, whoa, what's with this hole? Did one of the guys who attacked you do this? I did it, said Ikigo. Naruto stared at Ikigo. Then at the gaping wound in the ground. Then at back Ikigo. Alarm and pride mixed visibly on his face. Then, to everyone's surprise, Naruto gave Ikigo a quick hug and stepped back. It's fine, he said mysteriously. You're alive, so it's fine. Ikigo looked startled and maybe a bit embarrassed, but he had lost some of the stiffness to his expression. Khan, meanwhile, had taken the opportunity to transfer to Ikigo's shoulder and peering down at the furrow. While, Ikigo, muttered Khan, you've really lost your touch. This is barely a scratch compared to, oof. Ikigo tightened his grip around the plush doll. Shut up, Khan, he hissed. The toy screamed a few muffled protests, but didn't say anything more when Ikigo let go. Surely, the redhead knew the rest of them had heard something and that there was no way the ANBU, at least, would let it go. But they were all willing to let it rest until they returned to Konoha, especially when Naruto's challenging glare stopped them from asking any questions. Lee asked them in his own mind as he examined the trough once more. What would a more impressive attack look like? Would it reach deeper into the earth? Extend a greater distance? If Ikigo had tried, could he have spread out the attack to reach the third Shinobi also? Asking Ikigo outright would no doubt be met with a refusal to answer. Perhaps Naruto would know. Neji remained behind with one of the ANBU to examine the site more closely. The other ANBU had sealed away the bodies and, after casting a sleeping jutsu on the remaining prisoner, was carrying him across his back. He kept pace slightly behind the group rather than going on ahead. Kakashi and Guy were in front while Naruto and Ikigo held the middle with Tenten and Lee at the rear. No one commented on Ikigo's skill at tree jumping though only a few days ago it would have been a completely surprise. Now that we have your skill firsthand, we must definitely spar again with your favored weapon, said Lee cheerfully. In front of him, Ikigo flinched slightly. On his shoulder, Khan whipped his head around and made frantic stop motions. Apparently, Lee had stumbled onto a touchy subject though he wasn't sure how. I'm not sure that's a good idea, said Ikigo quietly. Really? Asked Tenten. I was hoping for a go at someone who didn't think fists were the be-all and all of Teijutsu for a change. I'm not very good at sparring. Not the way you think of sparring. Even with the Bakken, replied Ikigo. 
What does that even mean? Demanded Naruto, who seemed determined to find out more about his cousin even as Khan warned him off. Ikigo glanced briefly at the ANBU moving with them then heaved a sigh. That attack back there would have barely registered for the people who trained me. They believed in do or die. Emphasis on the die. Maybe it would be okay with you, Tenten, but I'd rather not risk it on an unarmed opponent, especially one I'd have to fight as seriously as you, Lee. Lee knew he shouldn't be offended. He had just seen three highly skilled shinobi destroyed by that attack without ever sensing it coming. He should be appreciative that Ikigo considered his skills serious enough to pose a threat. Not every shinobi was impressed by his no chakra teijutsu. Still, it rankled just a bit. That's not a stance most shinobi would take, said Kakashi idly. Well, I am not a shinobi, said Ikigo bitterly. I suppose not, agreed Kakashi. He kept going intentionally oblivious to Ikigo's darkening mood. So, Ikigo-san, if that little hole back there isn't one of your stronger attacks, what's the most impressive thing you've ever broken? Lee saw Gai sensei glance at his self-proclaimed rival, but no one said anything to put a stop to the questioning. Not even Naruto despite his troubled glances. When he answered, Ikigo sounded wistful. I killed two people today. Lee's face wasn't very expressive, except when he put real effort into it. It was simply too memorable for him to take undercover missions. He suspected no one looking at him would sense his confusion, but he felt it was plain to see. Certainly killing people was unfortunate, but they were shinobi. The death of others meant life for the village. He caught Tenten's eyes. She gave him a half-shrug equally confused. Naruto looked oddly conflicted, and Lee could see the sorrow written in the lines of tension on Gai Sensei's back who knew what Kakashi and the ANBU thought behind their masks. Fair enough, said Kakashi at last. But you don't find many philosophers in the ranks, so perhaps a more literal example. Ah, well, the tips of Ikigo's ear flushed pink with embarrassment. I've destroyed a lot of stuff over the years. Something in soul society, probably. What do you think, Khan? The little lion snorted. Even expecting it, it was strange to hear the doll reply. Ikigo, you broke soul society, period. Hey, we didn't cause that much damage, protested Ikigo sounding put out. Rukengai is basically fine, except for that area they switched out with Karakura. That's not what I meant, muttered Khan. But, let's think. How about that time with the mountain? I don't think that should count, said Ikigo quickly. The thing with Oin, offered Khan. I wasn't the one to break the seal, said Ikigo. Hitting it again just stopped it from working for a little while. You broke through the barrier surrounding Serete, said Khan. You know, the one that destroys whatever gets too close. Ikigo waved a hand. That definitely doesn't count. The whole gang helped with that and we used Kyukaku's special cannonball kidu. Ah, uh, you broke the arbor of the Sakaioku. I don't think anyone's ever managed that before, said Khan. I don't think anyone's ever tried that before, replied Ikigo. Besides Shunsui and Jushiro were the ones to actually break the Sakaioku. I mean, most of what I broke was random buildings or seals. Nothing really. Ikigo trailed off suddenly. Lee was curious about the mountain. Did Ikigo destroy a mountain? Did he not? He barely recognized half the words Khan was using. They must have been places and artifacts from the land Ikigo used to live, or more accurately, Ikigo's father's homeland as there was apparently some difference. Privately, Lee thought Ikigo's father's people must be quite arrogant given the names they bestowed upon their lands and tools. Did you think of something? Prodded Kakashi. The gates, said Ikigo quietly. That probably did the most damage. Gates? Asked Kon. What ga? Oh, yes. That caused a serious problem. And you broke them twice. Going in and coming out. Not to mention all the damned souls that could have escaped and all of the hell energy that was released into Karakura. Of course, most of Karakura was probably screwed from their brief visit to Soul Society, not to mention you living there for 18 years, so that probably wasn't as bad as it could have been. What gates? Demanded Naruto. What are you talking about? The gates of hell, said Ikigo idly. Naruto missed the next branch and went crashing to the ground prompting the whole party to stop and stare. Lee was especially concerned. He lacked the chakra control necessary for tree walking, but even he could recover more gracefully than that. Naruto was back with them in less than a moment, shaking off the 20-foot drop like it had never happened. Are you serious? Yelled Naruto. His voice reached new heights of alarm beyond what he had already displayed for Ikigo. The gates of hell. What were you even thinking? Ah, oh, some people kidnapped Yuzu, and I had to get her back, said Ikigo. Would this be the incident that made your sister so insistent? Asked Kakashi. Ikigo nodded. Yeah, the atmosphere's pretty bad there. I suppose you could say she got infected. What are you talking about? Asked a hopelessly confused Lee. The gates to hell. What are those? It's a prison, said Ikigo. It's nominally run by Soul Society and but has a very specialized staff. 
The gates were thought to be unbreakable, until I had to go in and get Yuzu. What did people from hell want with Yuzu anyway? Demanded Naruto. He's so nice. Ikigo blushed faintly and ducked his head. Lee realized he was embarrassed and wondered why. On Ikigo's shoulder, Khan started chortling. Some of the prisoners saw one of Ikigo's fights and how much of a mess he made, explained Khan. They wanted to use Ikigo's power to bust them out and tried to kidnap Karin and Yuzu so he would go in after them. Ikigo's just embarrassed because he played right into their hands. The back of Ikigo's neck was bright red. Lee could only assume his face was the same. It clashed horribly with his orange hair, even Lee could see that. Ikigo reached back to tug nervously at his hair. It was remarkably similar to one of Naruto's nervous tics. Lee hadn't realized things like that could be inherited. He glanced at Tenten, who was looking back and forth between the two having noticed the same thing. It's Yuzu, said Ikigo. It's not like I wouldn't have gone after her, even if I had known about the plan. Guy took a moment to flash Ikigo a thumbs up and Naruto was beaming in approval. That was the Konoha way, after all, to put your comrades first no matter the odds. That Yuzu was family was incidental. Lee felt his heart swell in response. Ikigo's burning desire to protect his sisters was most youthful. I don't understand, said Tenten. If they could sneak out to kidnap Yuzu and Karin, then why did they need you to break them out? Ikigo waved his arms pointing to an imaginary manacle. It's the chains they use. The uh, ah, uh, wardens can use them to track the prisoners even if they escape. Breaking the gates was probably a distraction for Soul Society. They really wanted me to break the chains. The chains Yuzu summoned to use on Anko, Kakashi began. Look a lot like the ones in hell, yes, agreed Ikigo. There was certain finality to his tone that suggested he would not be answering any more questions. Ibuki will be thrilled, said Kakashi mostly to Guy. It seemed he recognized Ikigo's resolve. He's already looking for a way to make Yuzu more intimidating. An escapee from hell sounds like a nice route. A most beneficial coincidence, agreed Guy. But one must imagine how mighty and how horrible a prison it must be to deserve the name hell. Naruto let out a strange burble but managed not to fall out the trees again. After a moment, Lee decided he would shift his concern from Ikigo to his future hawkage. Ikigo seemed more than capable of taking care of himself. Naruto, on the other hand, well, he was obviously regressing. Lee could keep an eye out for him, just until they got to the tower. Tsunade Sama would be able to fix whatever was wrong with Naruto, even if took a solid hit or two. Tsunade tapped a nail against the varnished wood of her desk. The group of shinobi was virtually identical to the other day. Just missing Neji, who was still scouting the attack site, and Shikamaru, who was working with the limited information they had garnered from the cart drivers. Hopefully this new prisoner would have more for them to work with. Lee concluded his after-action report and rejoined the line. Tsunade shifted her gaze to Ikigo. You are supposed to be the one staying out of trouble, she said. Ikigo scowled. It's not like I go looking for it intentionally. The little lion doll on his shoulder snickered. Tsunade shot at a suspicious look. Khan gulped and ducked away out of sight. Be that as it may, said Tsunade. If you were running around Konoha and you encountered missing Nin, why not keep running? Or at least head back to the rest of the team. I thought you were trying to avoid fighting. Lee stepped forward again. I apologize, Hawkage Sama. In my excitement, I did not think to report that part of the encounter. We had stopped because Ikigo displayed signs of injury, presumably internal bleeding indicated by vomiting blood. When the missing nin appeared, I did not think it wise to resume running and was unable to avoid engaging in battle. Tsunade gaped, and she wasn't the only one. Every shinobi but Lee was staring at Ikigo. She was out of her seat with the green light of healing chakra surrounding her hands before she knew it. But still, Naruto managed to cut her off. What? He screeched. You said Neji checked you. He said you were fine. I am fine, snapped Ikigo automatically, obviously fed up. I fixed it. His expression softened slightly at Naruto's panicked expression. I really am fine. HMPH, Tsunade grunted. She circled around her desk and gave Ikigo a quick check nonetheless. He scan came back negative. You really are fine. Just like the other day. Tsunade leaned back against her desk and crossed her arms. So what happened to you other than an attack by missing Nin? Since someone failed to accurately report the situation. Ashamed, Lee stared at his feet. Tsunade let him wallow. She was the best medic nin in the elemental countries. The part about the missing nin mattered, but the healing was actually important. Ikigo heaved a sigh. I broke a couple of ribs because I was going too fast. It's not something I usually have to worry about when I'm a Shinigami. There was a squeak from someone in the room. Tsunade's head snapped up. None of her shinobi would admit to making such a pathetic noise in her presence. But discounting Naruto, who was still exuding anxiety from every pore, all eyes were locked on Ikigo. The ranks of Soul Society are referred to as Shinigami, said Tsunade. 
she thought she heard someone whisper arrogant bastards, and she definitely saw Ikigo's mouth twitch into a smile. She nodded. Keep going. All hint of a smile vanished. When I'm acting as a member of the court guard, I don't need to worry about that sort of thing. I just forgot. And how did you heal yourself? Asked Tsunade. That's not a Quincy technique, and Lee would have noticed if you had used one of your sister's spells. Ikigo looked guilty. He even shifted from foot to foot where he stood, something she had never seen from him in any of their encounters thus far. Instant regeneration, he said. It's a hollow ability. Tsunade was floored. She knew she had read every page on Yuzumaki Mamoru's journal. Hollows were deceased spirits that lingered on Earth until they became corrupted and started to eat other spirits to sustain themselves. Nowhere did it mention those sorts of abilities being possessed by living people. How did she began and cut herself off? No. Is there anyone else who has anything to add about the missing nin? Or what happened this afternoon? No. All of you, out. Hirasaki, Naruto. You stay. The rest of you, Shu. You too, Kakashi. She waited until the silver-haired Jounin had shut the door behind him and turned to face Ikigo. He was looking wary. He probably knew this sort of thing was a deal breaker, which was why he had avoided mentioning it before. Then Naruto stepped up beside him with a determined glint in his eye. I already said that I wouldn't turn him away for being strong, Bachan, he said. Tsunade saw Ikigo lose some of his tension at the words. She sighed and moved back to her chair. Curse her motherly affection for Naruto. How exactly did you acquire hollow powers? She asked. I died a little bit, said Ikigo. But I got better. You seem to be good at that, she said dryly. Is it going to be a problem? Ikigo looked wary. What do you mean? Are you going to start eating people? She demanded. Ikigo looked scandalized. No, of course not. I'm still human. I still have my heart. So I don't have to worry about that sort of thing. My hollow isn't interested in eating people anyway. Tsunade quirked a brow. And what does interest your hollow? Ikigo blushed. Fighting people. He continued over her snort. When I died that time, I died with my heart full of regret. I regretted that I was too weak to protect Rukia or myself. And I regretted that I couldn't keep fighting. So my hollow's greatest desire is to fight. Tsunade understood that regret. She knew Naruto did too from the look on his face alone if nothing else. Well, that probably wouldn't be a problem then. Do you have any other powers I should know about? She asked. Beside your Quincy gifts, your Shinigami powers, and your hollow abilities. Ikigo crossed his arms and thought about it. He really needed to think about it. Tsunade could scarcely believe it and it was happening in front of her nose. I also have Kushinata powers and Fullbring, he said. Kushinata powers are what let me break up Yuzu's chains. And Fullbring, well, it's this power humans can have if their mothers are attacked by Hollow while pregnant. I can't do very much with that though just increase my speed a little and walk on stuff that shouldn't be walked on. That sort of thing. Awesome, said Naruto bouncing a little in place. Tsunade pinched the bridge of her nose in a vain attempt to keep her headache at bay. There were two of them. There really was someone as powerful as Naruto and just as oblivious about the implications. She thought about it for a moment, looking again at the scowling Ikigo. No, he recognized his power. He was here because of it, because some fools in the afterlife of another dimension were afraid of it. But to Ikigo, power was secondary. Using that power to protect his family, his friends, that obviously came first. That fit quite nicely into Tsunade's plans. She leaned forward. Kurosaki san I have a proposal. He immediately looked wary. Yes, by tomorrow, I will have a dozen clan heads in here raising a stink about your stunt in the forest. I can always order them to shut up, but I have an idea that might work better, she explained. What is it? He asked. Tsunade met his eyes. I want you to enlist as a shinobi of Kano Hagakure no Sato. Ikigo's response was immediate. I would make a horrible ninja. That wasn't a no. Tsunade held up a hand. Hear me out. The report from T and I says those cart drivers were bribed to smuggle out the only untrained Yuzumaki in the village. That would be you. If you become a shinobi, it may make the people trying to kidnap you rethink their plans. Ikigo's expression was flat. You don't really think that. It certainly won't hurt, said Tsunade firmly. And what if, since I'm a full-fledged ninja, they decide to go after Yuzu or Karin? He asked. Karin is in the hospital when she isn't in class. Pretty soon Yuzu will start working with T. And I the only place in the whole village with more shinobi is the tower, said Tsunade. Ikigo still looked reluctant. I'm not kidding about being a horrible ninja. So he was still thinking about it. That was good. You'll be a genin. Never offered promotion. Genin mostly do D-rank missions, which are chores the villagers need doing. Carrying messages, organizing the mission's desks, 
simple things. Occasionally, a team will complete C-rank missions, which are outside the village and therefore more dangerous. You wouldn't be doing many of those. They could go look doubtful. That sounds like my part-time job in high. I don't think I'll scare off anyone that way. Sunaid leaned back in her chair. Two months from now are the Chunin exams. There are two genin, Sarutobai Konohamaru and Hyuga Hanabi, who for various reasons have not been able to complete the exams. Passing them outside of the exam system would be seen as a weakness during peacetime, since both are so strong. If you become the third member of their team, get them to the final round and show off your skills in the elimination round. No one will doubt you are a Chunin level shinobi, even if I don't try to promote you. Not to mention the Hyuga and Sarutobai clans, both of whom are very influential in the village, will support you if the other clans still want to raise a fuss. Sunaid watched Ikigo. He was still scowling, but it was a thoughtful look rather than an unhappy one. Beside him, Naruto was all but vibrating in place. The blonde kept glancing between Tsunade and Ikigo like they were exchanging blows in a sparring match. Tsunade was honestly concerned that he might explode. This would be permanent, asked Ikigo, not just through the exams. Genin are required to serve 10 years in order to pay back Kanoha for their training, confirmed Tsunade. The amount of time would be less if you were promoted, but that won't happen in your case, and I'll just have to do D ranks and the occasional C rank once the exams are over, clarified Ikigo. No, assassinations or anything like that. There would of course be an exception in times of war, said Tsunade. You would have to go into situations where you will potentially fight and kill other people then. But I expect, in that case, you would have no objections. Ikigo shook his head. No, she hadn't thought so. Tsunade gave him another look. You know, it surprises me that you would even think of being asked to assassinate someone. You're not exactly built for it. Ikigo was too loud, too vibrant, and she wasn't referring just to his hair. Now that he wasn't sinking into the dark gloom of depression, he seemed to fill up a room just by being there. Naruto would probably be better at an assassination attempt. At least he had the training for it. There was a very peculiar expression on Ikigo's face. Ikigo, said Naruto carefully. Did Soul Society ask you to assassinate somebody? Ikigo flushed. Well, no, well, yes. There was already a battle going on, and I was just supposed to wait for an opening and anyway it didn't work. He coughed and cleared his throat. I will agree to your proposal with one condition. Tsunade waited. And waited. And waited. Yes? She asked. Ikigo blinked. Oh, if there is ever a certain problem in soul society, I may have to go back. But it shouldn't be a problem. Tsunade shook her head slightly. Oh, to be young and deliberately cryptic. But he had agreed. That was enough for her. Very well, she said. Tsunade reached down into her desk and pulled out a blank application form. This hadn't been an idle thought of hers. She had given it serious consideration ever since the Kurosakis arrived in Kanoha and he admitted to having military training. But she hadn't been so sure to fill out his name on the form. She did that now and handed it over. Fill that out and give to the mission desk, she said. They'll issue you a hit I ate. As of this moment you are Genin of Kanoha. Ikigo snapped to attention and performed a perfect salute. Theory. He must have been watching Lee. He was the only shinobi to salute sharply like that. Report tomorrow to training ground 10 to meet your team. Naruto, escort our newest shinobi back to his apartment. He's going to need to get ready. Dismissed. Naruto and Ikigo both saluted. Naruto, for once, left using the door. She looked at the backs of the two boys as they left. Ikigo's orange hair and blue tunic were a remarkable contrast to Naruto's yellow hair and orange coat. Those were the shinobi of the future and it was looking bright. Tsunade quickly pulled out a bottle of celebratory sake and filled a saucer. Raising the cup she toasted the newest ninja, and pouring another round she toasted herself. Licking her lips, she grinned. Score one for the hawkage. She might be old, but she still had it. Kira and I reclined against a tree watching two of her newest students bicker back and forth. Konohamaru and Hanabi had known each other since their academy days, and after their original teams had passed the Chunin exams when they had not, were often partnered together despite their clashing personalities. Her nephew, Asuma's really but everyone considered him her nephew, had a vibrant personality. He loved to talk to people and fight with other shinobi to test his skills. The tan coat he usually wore was surprisingly bland, but he more than made up for it with the long blue scarf he wore around his neck. Most shinobi would never intentionally give their opponents a method to strangle them, and Konohamaru did occasionally remove it for his more serious missions, but as a ninjutsu specialist rather than a teijutsu specialist he felt he could get away with it. Hanabi, on the other hand, was generally a quiet, serious girl like most of her clan. Unlike her clan, she stayed away from whites and pale grays and always wore a black tank top and matching black pants, 
usually over metal mesh. Hinata had confided in Kiranai that it was Hanabi's goal to become the top assassin in ANBU having a driven personality that did not favor her family's usual style of defensive combat. Nonetheless, she was a master of the Hyuga, gentle fist style. As the friendly argument between Kanohamaru and Hanabi exploded into a shouting match, Kiranai mused there were always exceptions to the rule. Kanohamaru could make friends with anyone, except Hanabi, and Hanabi could put up with anything, except Kanohamaru's antics. Their fights were legendary already, and they were still only genin, but anyone trying to step in between the two would be met by blistering opposition from both sides. The one thing they agreed on was that were both leaf genin and that the shinobi of Kanoha should always look out for each other. It was the only reason they managed to work as a team. Kiranai's attention was thankfully diverted by someone else entering the training ground. He was above average height, dressed in a blue tunic and black pants with woven sandals over white tabi. The bright orange of his hair matched his orange sash, where he had a wooden bakken tied to his waist. Kiranai easily recognized Kurosaki Ikigo from the file Tsunade had sent her yesterday afternoon and from the scowl that Kakashi had described as his default expression. Kiranai subtly checked her watch. 7.58 he was cutting it close. She stood up and brushed the dirt of off her white dress. It was an impractical thing to wear for most shinobi, but she was a jinjutsu expert. No one would see her if she didn't want them to. Konohamaru and Hanabi both saw her stand and turned to look at their new teammate. He raised a hand in greeting. Sorry about running late, he said. No one actually told me where training ground 10 was, so I had to ask for directions. For a moment, his head turned to the side. Kiranai followed his gaze and caught a flash of bone white mask. He had asked his ANBU guard for directions. She shook her head. He really had to be Naruto's cousin. No one else would be so bold. You're just on time, said Kiranai as the team formed a loose semicircle in front of her. For the purposes of the village, this is Genin Team 3 under Jounin Sensei Yuhai Kiranai. Let's do some introductions. I'll go first. My name is Yuhai Kiranai. I've been a Jounin of Konoha for 11 years. My hobbies are taking care of my daughter and developing Jinjutsu. My dream for the future is to see my child grow up. She looked to the left at Konohamaru. My name is Saruto by Konohamaru. I've been a Jenin of Konoha for, ugh, 8 years. My hobbies are helping out with my cousin and learning ninjutsu. My dream for the future is to learn as many ninjutsu as my grandfather and become Hawkage. Kiranai smiled. Konohamaru was an excellent babysitter for her daughter. Though now that she was training in the academy, she really didn't need an after-hours watcher. But it was good for all three of them to know that they had family to rely on in case of trouble. She turned toward Hanabi. I'm Hyuga Hanabi. I am also a genin of Kanoha. My hobbies are teijutsu practice and flower arranging. My dream for the future is to bring honor to clan Hyuga through my service to Kanoha. Well, that was one way to phrase become an assassin, thought Kiranai. Though as her teammates, as Shinobi, Hanabi did not need to hide her real goals from them. She looked at Ikigo. I'm Kurosaki Ikigo. I've been a Konoha genin since yesterday. My hobbies are reading Shakespeare and fighting, I guess. My dream for the future. He trailed off. Kiranai frowned slightly. Konohamaru and Hanabi had known their goals for a long time, and she understood that Ikigo had been recently displayed, but he should still have some concrete idea of what he wanted to do, even if it was only reach the Chunin exams. My dream for the future is to protect my precious people, said Ikigo. Kiranai smiled again. It was a good dream, even if it was a hard one. Hey, you're the boss's cousin, right? Asked Konohamaru. Ikigo blinked. The boss, Naruto, Naruto, said Konohamaru. I escorted you and your sisters to the Hawkage the first day you got here. You said you were looking for family. It was the boss, right? Ikigo tilted his head in confusion. That was you. Konohamaru's jaw dropped. How could you forget? He set on fist on his hip and flung out the other arm. His scarf floated in the air behind him. The great Konohamaru. Ikigo pointed. I remember now. You fell out of the gatehouse. Over Konohamaru's spluttering protests he continued, Yeah, we're related. We have the same grandfather. That meant Ikigo's grandfather was Kushina's father. She didn't remember much about the red-hot-blooded habanero. To her, Kushina had been another Kanoichi of the village, strong, certainly, and a woman she could admire. But she had been nothing more than another shinobi lost on the night of the Kyuubai attack. Another name on the memorial stone. Not a person to mourn the way Kakashi did. You spar with cousin Neji's team, asked Hanabi cutting through Kiranai thoughts. For the past few days, said Ikigo, you must be related. And to Hinata too, right. She is my older sister, confirmed Hanabi. She barreled on. 
Neji says you are very good at hand to hand and that you do not find Lee or Guy dot 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 too much. Nah, said Ikigo. Some of the guys back in the 11th are just as bad, and Lee and Guy don't insult your fashion choices while they're at it. The idea of Guy or Lee insulting anyone about their choice of clothing was so remarkable it took Kirinai a moment to find her train of thought. Luckily, Kano Hemaru and Hanabi were equally stunned. We'll hold off on a Teijutsu assessment for now. Since you are sparring with Team Guy, I'm sure you'll do fine, she told Ikigo. Honestly, in that case, Kirinai hoped she was capable of keeping up. Guy's former Genin were all monsters at their chosen styles. She turned to include the other Genin. Your first team assignment is this, Konohamaru and Hanabi will teach Ikigo tree walking. Ikigo looked mildly confused. Konohamaru and Hanabi stared at her in dismay. What? demanded Konohamaru. Ikigo has no experience using chakra at all, so it's something he needs to work on, said Kurenai brightly. Teaching him will be a good reminder for the two of you. And what will you be doing, Kurenai-sensei? asked Hanabi. There was no mistaking the sullen tone in her voice. I'll be supervising, of course, said Kurenai. Now, get to it. She settled back under her tree to watch. It might have been mean of her to start with something like this, but her goal was prepare a team for the Chunin exams. If they couldn't work together for something as simple as this, well, Tsunade Sama would just have to grit her teeth and promote Konohamaru and Hanabi outside of the normal ranking matches. It would be a blow to village pride but holding the two back any longer would definitely hurt their careers. Ikigo was looking at his fellow Genin in confusion. Tree walking isn't like tree jumping then because I can already to that. No, said Hanabi. Konohamaru cleared his throat. Tree walking refers to gathering chakra to the soles of your feet and using it to attach yourself to another surface. You can use it to walk anywhere that isn't level ground. But around Konoha it's usually trees. Let me demonstrate. Konohamaru turned and planted his feet on the nearest tree. After a few casual strides, he was hanging upside down from the nearest branch. It was neat work, but Kirinai could tell he wasn't converting his chakra in a totally efficient manner. He didn't have to be as precise as Medic Nin, but as a ninjutsu specialist he would to do better than the average shinobi. Ikigo looked impressed. That's got to be useful for hiding out of the way. What's the catch? If you use too much, you blast yourself off the tree, said Hanabi. If you use too little, Konohamaru abruptly cut his chakra flow and dropped to the ground, flipping around to land on his feet, you fall off. It all depends on how well you can control the chakra flow, continued Hanabi. You can form chakra, can't you? I did it once, said Ikigo staring at his feet. He missed the pained looks Konohamaru and Hanabi sent her way. Kirinai sent them a pointed look right back despite her own surprise. Hawkage's instructions said Kurosaki had demonstrated the potential to use chakra, not that he had never used it. The silent contest of wills between Jounin instructor and Jenin was interrupted by a sudden surge in chakra from Ikigo. Kirinai was no sensor type but even she had felt that. Before she, or anyone else, could issue a warning, Ikigo apparently sent all of that energy into his feet. He blasted himself a foot into the air before losing his concentration and promptly crashing back down raising a small puff dust. Ikigo groaned faintly. He had landed on his back, no doubt winding him. Hanabi leaned over to look into his face. That was too much, she said and promptly activated her Byakugan. Hum, your Tenketsu look fine. The release the Byakugan again. Way to not permanently damage your chakra coils. Her voice was a complete deadpan the entire time. A stark contrast to Konohamaru, whose faces of panic, dismay, and relief grew increasingly ridiculous even as he reached out to give Ikigo a hand up. Kirinai tried not to groan. If Konoha's most promising genin couldn't pass the exams, maybe they could start a stand-up comedy routine. What was that about chakra coils? Asked Ikigo when he was back on his feet. You can burn out your chakra coils by using too much chakra, said Konohamaru. Usually, you can recover, but if you use too much, it's permanent. Try not to do that again, okay? Ikigo carefully touched the back of his head and winced. Right, so how do I avoid it? Start with less, said Hanabi. You only need so much chakra to match the tree, so don't draw too much to start with. Start with less, muttered Ikigo. He closed his eyes. When Kirinai reached out with her senses, she could feel the chakra slowly pooling in the new genin. Ever so carefully, Ikigo let a tiny trickle coat the bottom of his feet. For a moment, everything was fine. Then Ikigo's weight shifted, and he windmilled his arms desperately to stay balanced. Kirinai winced as he crashed back down. That wasn't enough, said Hanabi helpfully. Konohamaru put his face in his hands. It's the first time I've seen someone fail at tree walking before they reach the tree. Ikigo climbed to his feet. It was better that time, at least. Konohamaru sighed. Yeah, you didn't blow yourself up. 
so that's good. Use something in between those two this time, but more like the second time, please. If you start out with too much or too little, you should be able to adjust the amount, added Hanabi. Ikigo tried again. Taking Konohamaru's advice, he used a little more chakra, but it still wasn't enough. Starting to slide, he adjusted the amount of chakra again but for some reason limited the change to just one foot and shot across the grass. Kurenai stared in amazement as Ikigo slid back and forth over the grassy clearing like a one of the ice dancers from Snow Country. An exceedingly drunk ice dancer. She had never seen anything like it before. She could easily think of a dozen Teijutsu applications for sliding out of the way in battle without ever changing one stance. It would be better if Ikigo had done it on purpose, but maybe he could once his control improved. Eventually, a very, very long eventually, Ikigo slowed to a stop. The next step he took was normal, and so was the one after that. I think I've got it, he said with relief. Konohamaru gave him a thumbs up. Awesome, now try it on the tree. Kira and I cleared her throat as Ikigo moved to do just that. All three genin turned to look at her. They might have forgotten she was there. Ikigo's display had been entertaining. Don't forget, Ikigo, that the amount of chakra you need will be different because you'll be fighting gravity, she warned. Not too different, but it's something to keep in mind. Ikigo nodded. Right, he turned toward the tree in intense expression of concentration on his face. If he could cast a fire release, Kiranai was sure the tree would smoking charcoal. Ikigo took a careful step, then another. He had to bend awkwardly the first meter or so, so he didn't slam his head into the ground. But after that, he straightened out and walked easily up to the branch Konohamaru reached and passed it. He found a branch of his own and walked out steadily upside down along the bottom. Kiranai was impressed. Some genin had no trouble getting tree walking on their first try. Hinata was one of those, and presumably so was Hanabi. However, most genin needed a few tries before they felt comfortable hanging upside down. Ikigo hadn't hesitated. Well done, she said rising to her feet to stand with the other genin. Now, how are you going to get back down? Ikigo looked up at them from his perch then down from his feet. Scowling, he crouched and set his hands next to his feet on the underside of the branch. Then he carefully let go of the chakra in his feet and unfurled his body until he was hanging straight down with his hands stuck to the branch with chakra. Then he cut the flow to his hands and dropped lightly to the ground. How did I do? He asked. Great, said Konohamaru. Hanabi nodded. It was very good for a first attempt, said Kiranai. You'll need more practice, but I have just the thing for that. She slipped a scroll out of her pouch. Ikigo looked curious, while the other two hovered between interested and bored. They had to do a lot of D-ranks over the years, though mostly they were being assigned C-ranks as a team with a supervising Jounin or Chunin these days. A mission scroll, asked Hanabi. I thought D-ranks were mostly chores, said Ikigo. Oh, this isn't just any D-rank, said Kiranai smirking. Hanabi and Konohamaru both paled. Ikigo looked at his teammates in alarm. No, Aunt Kiranai, said Konohamaru. Not that. Anything but that. Please, said Hanabi quietly but no less fervently. Please, Kiranai-sensei, not the cat. We've already done our time. But Ikigo hasn't and you're a team now, she said. Where one goes, all must go. What was this about a cat? Asked Ikigo. Kiranai waved the mission scroll at him. The fire daimyo's wife visited Konoha yesterday. Her cat, Tora, took the opportunity to escape. Team 3's mission is to find the cat and return it to the Hawkage's office. That doesn't sound too hard, said Ikigo hesitantly casting a wary eye at his teammates. It's a demon, muttered Konohamaru. Hanabi's eyes were closed and she was mouthing a quiet prayer. Pure and I rolled her eyes at their antics. In addition to completing the mission as stated, I want you all to use the tree walking technique the entire time. You are not allowed to set foot on the ground until the mission is complete. This will be harder for you, Ikigo, since you just learned it. But it will also benefit you, Hanabi, and especially you, Konohamaru. It may take a while to find Tora, and you'll need to use your chakra efficiently. I'll find it, said Hanabi. I swear, I'll find it. No stupid cat can escape my Bayakugan. The rest of the team stared at her. Kira and I thought she would check Hanabi's records and see how many times she had been assigned the Tora mission. It wouldn't have changed Kira and I's decision, of course, but that was a very strong reaction. When do we start? Asked Ikigo. Kira and I looked at them. You start now. Meet you at the tower when you're done. Forming the ram seal, she used Shunshin to disappear from the clearing then she applied a chameleon jutsu and walked back in. She would be tracking the team's progress from afar. Hanabi would be able to see her, but Kiranai trusted the girl would keep her mouth closed. Hinata had done so when Kiranai assigned teammate the Tora mission as Jenin. I didn't expect it, not from Kiranai-sensei, said Hanabi mournfully. 
Nissan always said she was so nice. Konohamaru shook his head. She's been spending too much time with Shikamaru and Kakashi. She's gotten all their bad habits. Ikigo was peering around the clearing. His gaze settled briefly on Kurinai's hiding spot. He quirked a brow and moved on. Kurinai subtly checked her jutsu. She was definitely hidden. There was no way he could have seen her. Where should we start? Asked Ikigo. The beast often takes refuge in the woods, said Hanabi. Ikigo looked around the clearing. They were surrounded by trees on all sides and this was only one training ground. Anywhere more specific than that. We'll go find where the daimyo's wife is staying, said Konohamaru. Tora usually makes a ruckus getting away. Konohamaru took the lead at the trio of Jen and left to track the cat. They were being very careful not to touch the ground. Most of the time they were jumping from tree trunk to tree trunk rather than the flat limbs for the extra challenge. Pure and I stuck close to hear their conversation. This is just a normal cat, right? Asked Ikigo. It's not a two-tailed one or anything. One of the biju. Mused Konohamaru. No, the two tails was in Kumo. But a descendant maybe. Can the biju have descendants? What are you talking about? Asked Ikigo. Konohamaru cast him a confused glance. He just asked if Toro was the two tails. I asked if it was a two tails, said Ikigo. You know, cats that live 100 years gain an extra tail and become demons. Konohamaru boggled. Even Hanabi turned her head to stare. Kurinai frowned. She had never heard anything like that before. Everyone knew, now at least, that the Sage of Six Paths had created the Nine Biju from the Ten Tails. There weren't any others. Ikigo correctly interpreted their response as a denial. He looked thoughtful. So you've only got one nine-tailed fox, too. There aren't any more of those running around either. No, shouted Konohamaru and Hanabi. Ikigo yelped in surprise and slid off a branch. He slapped it with his hands as he passed. One slid off, but the other stuck firm. He hung there swaying for a moment or two then hauled himself back up shooting his teammates an annoyed look. He jumped to the next tree continuing in the direction of the village proper and dragging his teammates in his wake. They were both too busy thinking about the possibility of Milletplea Nine Tails to really notice. Under normal circumstances, Kira and I wouldn't blame them, but they were on a mission. Even if it was just a D rank, she would have to dock points in their evaluation. How do you end up with more than one nine tails? Asked Hanabi. It's like the two-tailed cat. A fox lives so long and gains another tail and then another. Nine-tailed foxes are the oldest and most powerful, said Ikigo. They broke out of the forest and onto a street. There was a moment of confusion as all three genin automatically jumped for a lamp post. Ikigo did a curious little flick with his feet and landed on a nearby bench instead. Pure and I knew he was heading the wrong way and wanted to know how he managed to change direction in midair, while Konohamaru claimed the top of the lamp and Hanabi clung to the side of the pole. After a swift debate, Konohamaru took the lead, Ikigo the middle, and Hanabi the rear. They would follow in each other's footsteps through the busier areas to avoid crashing. Theoretically, by walking in that order one of the other of the more experienced genin would be able to catch Ikigo if fell again. And, when they reached that stage, Hanabi could use her Byakugan just as well from the rear as she could from the front. It was nice planning, and Kurinai mentally applauded them for taking their teammates' weakness into account. And you just have all these nine-tailed foxes running around, asked Konohamaru when they were underway once more. Ikigo's scowl was a constant, Kurinai noticed, but now he seemed to disapprove of the idea itself rather than life in general. It was remarkable how much feeling he could convey with a single facial expression. I've never seen one, said Ikigo. They're mythical creatures. But Captain Kamamura was his yakai, a demon, so I guess the others exist too. Neither of the genin had anything to say to that, and they returned their attention to the mission. But it gave Kira and I something to think about as the team searched for traces of the cat. She had never heard either of those legends. The only tailed beasts she knew of were the tailed beasts, but in Ikigo's homeland there were others, and no special weight given to the one sealed in his cousin's stomach. The possibility dawned on Kirinai as she followed the genin back out of the developed districts and into a different set of woods that Ikigo had never heard of the Kyuubai until he arrived in village. She knew he was not originally from Kanoha. His file contained no information one way or the other, but rumor said the Kurosakis weren't even from the elemental countries. But if he wasn't from the elemental countries, surely his homeland had been affected by infinite Tsukayomi. The Jinjutsu had been cast over the entire world. They had to have known something about what was going on and that meant knowing about the tailed beasts. But what if they hadn't? The implications disturbed Kirinai, and she almost missed the team finding Tora. The cat was sunning itself in the center of a clearing conveniently out range of any handy branches. With the advantage of Hanabi's Byakugan, 
They had been able to reach the tree line without alerting Tora to his approaching capture. After staring at the cat and the distance to the nearest branch, only a few meters, but oh what a difference it made, Konohamaru started signaling a plan. Hanabi was nodding along, but Ikigo was staring blankly in confusion. It took the other genin a minute or two to realize the problem. Ikigo was a brand new genin who had never attended the academy. He didn't even know basic hand signs much less the elaborate ones Konohamaru was using to outline his plan. Konohamaru started pantomiming instead, which in Kiranai's opinion was even more confusing. Hanabi must have agreed because she cut him off with a sharp gesture that pulled a senbin out of her pouch, and smiled. Evilly, Konohamaru and Ikigo exchanged a startled look. Both males grabbed one of her wrists, and, in an excellent display of synchronization from a newly formed team, dragged her away from the clearing. They made a little noise as they went, but all Tora did was flick an ear and roll onto his back to get more sun. Tira and I pitied the cat just a little. By this point in the year, all the new genin teams had drawn the Tora mission at least once and knew better than to accept it. That meant some poor, unlucky Chunin had to track down the cat on his or her own the day the fire Damio's wife left the village. Tora was probably expecting a few more days of freedom. She went to track down her wayward genin. They weren't too far away, just outside of the cat's hearing range. All three were attached to various tree limbs discussing strategy. Attached to one branch, then I'm attached to him, and then Hanabi would be attached to me. She can grab the cat since she has the best reflexes, concluded Konohamaru. The beast is crafty, said Hanabi. It wouldn't work. My plan is best. Paralyzing the cat with Senbin is not returning him in good condition, said Ikigo. That's a requirement of the mission. Konohamaru snorted. I don't see why. The daimyo's wife will squeeze the life out of it the second we hand it over. Ikigo sighed. What if one of us goes to the other side and sends the running toward the other two? Tor is pretty tricky, said Konohamaru. It can probably dodge us. Ikigo scowled. Well, can you do any of those earth attacks? Make a hole or raise some walls? Konohamaru looked thoughtful. An earth release jutsu. Those are pretty advanced. But I can make some walls no problem. Ikigo nodded and looked at Hanabi. Do you want me to catch the cat? It is probably for the best, she said coldly. I will find a spot for the ambush. Hanabi activated her by a Kugan. She didn't turn her head, but then she didn't need to. Kuranai gave a cheerful little wave knowing that the Hyuga girl would be able to see through her genjutsu. Hanabi tilted her head ever so slightly in acknowledgement. Ikigo, who was watching closely having not had a chance to see the long-range applications of the Bayakugan before, noticed the movement and turned to look. His gaze settled directly on Kuranai again. She frowned. How did he keep doing that? Was he a sensor type like Sasuke's follower? That was supposedly an Uzumaki talent. Five meters north on the edge of the clearing there is sufficient space to raise walls and a tree with a limb at the appropriate height, reported Hanabi drawing Ikigo's attention. I will circle around and begin when you are in position. Plans made, the genin split up to take their positions. Hanabi went one way while Konohemaru and Ikigo went another. Hiranai followed the boys. She would be able to see the results of Hanabi's hurting either way, but she could get a better feel for Konohemaru's jutsu from up close. Konohemaru had attached himself to a young tree near the bottom. They still couldn't touch the ground after all, and was already gathering chakra to start his jutsu. He had to wait until Tora hit the tree line. Otherwise the cat would know something was wrong and avoid the area. Ikigo had found the tree Hanabi mentioned and was crouched upside down underneath the limb. He would be able to shoot out and grab the cat as it passed underneath him. Kiranai positioned herself so she could see the genin in the field and waited. She didn't have to wait long. Once Hanabi saw the boys were in position, she started her assault on Tora. A senbin landed just beside the cat's tail waking it up and sending it running in the opposite direction with a startled yowl. A flurry of Senden, Kunai, and Shuriken kept the animal running in the correct direction. Tora made for the safety of the trees where the projectile weapons couldn't reach with the same sort of accuracy. As soon as Tora reached the relative safety of the forest, Konohamaru activated his earth release technique. Walls rose on either side of the cat, each at least a meter and a half high and ten centimeters thick. There was no way the cat could jump over those. Tora might have hesitated anyway, but alas Kunai from Hanabi hit the dirt wall behind its head and sent it charging forward. It was the easiest thing in the world for Ikigo to swing down and scoop up the cat as it ran past. Hiranai expected screeching cries, flying claws, and at least a little blood, but she got none of those. Ikigo actually knew how to hold an unhappy cat. He had Tora's front legs trapped in one hand, its back legs in the other, and held it tight against his torso so it couldn't wiggle free. All in all it was the easiest cat retrieval Kiranai had ever seen.
Hanabi quickly joined the boys. All three of them stared at the black cat in Ikigo's arms. I thought this was supposed to be hard, said Ikigo. The only thing that took Anna time was asking people where Tora had been. Just don't let it escape before we get back to the tower, said Konohamaru. That's happened before, and it's harder to capture when it know you're coming. Right, said Ikigo. We should get going then. The Jen and team started back to the village proper and the Hawkage Tower resuming the same straight line formation as before. Pure and I paced them easily. Konohamaru was correct about Tora's tendency to escape at the last moment. It hadn't been a problem for Team 8 when they had the Tora mission. But that was because Kiba and Akamaru's sense kept scaring the cat, and it took them 10 hours to track the beast down. By that time, Shino had been so fed up with the situation that he had his insects drain the cat of Chakra when they finally cornered it. The fire daimyo's wife had accepted the explanation that they had been playing with the cat until it was exhausted. Sarutobai-sama had not been amused. They were only a few streets away from the tower when Tora made his move. The cat sank its teeth into Ikigo's hand. Ikigo hissed in pain but gamely held onto the cat. Unfortunately, he lost his grip on his chakra and started to fall off the side of the building the genin were walking on. He automatically gathered his chakra. Kirinai felt the swell of energy where she was standing but likely realized blasting a hole in a shop owner's store was not going to be covered by the cost of the mission. He was in for a very nasty landing. Hanabi and Konohamaru reacted instantly. She reached out and grabbed him before he could go too far while Konohamaru spun around and down pushed him up and away from the busy street. The two genin waited until Ikigo had reattached himself to the building to relax their grip, but didn't let go entirely. Ikigo looked down menacingly at Tora. Try that again, I dare you. Whether or not the cat understood, it let out an angry yowl and bit Ikigo again. Or, it tried to bite anyway. The cat's mouth was in position but the sharp little teeth weren't moving. The cat made a very different sort of sound, a low whimper and gingerly removed its teeth and shut its mouth. Pure and I swore she saw tears in its eyes. That's what I thought, said Ikigo grimly. Let's go. Hanabi and Konohamaru exchanged curious looks but followed after their teammate. Pure and I realized that they would be delivering the cat after all and, after dropping her jinjutsu, used body flicker to beat them to the base of the tower. Once Tora was safely back in his owner's arms, safely always a relative term in that case, and Team 3 had submitted a brief verbal report to the hawkage, Kira and I gathered her team in a mostly secluded corner near the mission desk. You did a good job working together today, she said. You completed the mission assigned to you with relative ease and demonstrated good teamwork, especially at the end. It was just the Tora mission, said Konohamaru lacing his fingers behind his heat. Kira and I pointed at him. That was your biggest problem on this mission. You didn't take it seriously. She looked at each of her genin. Konohamaru looked startled. Hanabi ashamed. Ikigo, well, he had taken the mission more seriously than the other two, it was his very first after all. But he was listening intently to what she had to say. I know that some of you are ready, more than ready, to move on to better things, said Kirinai. But every mission, even D ranks, are important to the village. By not focusing at the start of your mission, you very nearly failed to meet my requirements. What if this had been a courier mission? What if you weren't paying attention because you had just left Konoha and ran straight into an ambush? I want you to think about that before we meet again tomorrow. Konohamaru and Hanabi both stared at their shoes. Ikigo looked faintly embarrassed and thoughtful, but he was the first to rally. So, we'll be meeting every day at 8. He asked, Monday through Friday at training ground 10, confirmed Kirinai. You have all of Saturday and Sunday morning off to spend time with your families and train independently and we'll meet Sunday afternoons to complete an extra D-rank. Of course, when we travel outside the village things will be different. Will we be doing a lot of that? Asked Ikigo. You have to complete at least one C-rank or better to be able to participate in the exams, said Kiranai. Konohamaru and Hanabi have done several with other teams, but we won't do one of those until you've had some more training. Some of the tension in Ikigo, which she hadn't even noticed until that point, drained away at her assurances. Kira and I wondered if he was worried about leaving the village, but he had arrived in Konoha less than two weeks ago. She would have to find out if anything had happened on the trip. Kotsu or Izuma would know. They knew all the gossip that came through the gates. That sounds fine, said Ikigo in reply. Karin and Yuzu should be better trained by then. Kira and I didn't let her curiosity show on her face. Ikigo was concerned for his sisters and thought he could protect them better than a village full of shinobi. She would have to learn if there was anything unusual about the kidnapping. She could ask Guy. He had been there for both attempts. She would have to talk to him anyway to get a fair assessment of Ikigo's teijutsu skills anyway. 
my father would like to invite the team to dinner on Saturday, since we will be entering the exams together, said Hanabi into the silence. Kirinai suppressed a wince. She remembered her first dinner at Hyuga compound when she was teammates Jown and instructor. The relationship between Hinata and her father had improved since then, but the pall of gloom at that first meeting was hard to forget. Konohamaru, on the other hand, appeared unbothered. 1900 hours as usual. Hanabi nodded. Kirinai was startled to remember that Konohamaru had done this before. His last two entries in the Chunin exam had him partnered with Hanabi, even if the teams were only temporary and just for the exams. Failure on the part of the third member of the team was what kept both Jenin from advancing to the final round and possible promotion. That should be fine, said Kirinai. Don't forget, tomorrow we meet at 8. Team 3 dismissed. The Jenin saluted. Konohamaru and Hanabi both wandered off, but Ikigo lingered. Is something wrong? Asked Kirinai. This was Ikigo's first day as a shinobi. She wouldn't be surprised if he had questions. She had some of her own. Ikigo shook his head. No, no. He looked mildly distressed. It's just dinner at the Hyugas. What should I expect? Kirinai smiled sympathetically. At least he had the sense to ask. The Hyuga are a very traditional clan. You should wear something formal if you have it. Though given your circumstances, meaning his status as a newly arrived refugee, it will be understandable if you don't. Other than that, be on your best behavior. We'll swing by the compound tomorrow so you can see where it is. Thank you, Kurenai-sensei, said Ikigo. He departed too leaving Kurenai on her own. She checked her watch. They really had completed the Torah mission in record time. It was just about time for the academy to end for the day. She could pick up her daughter and go out for an early dinner. The team had stopped briefly to buy some rice balls in the market, the vendor only staring slightly as he negotiated with Jenin standing parallel to the ground, but that was only a light snack to tide them over until the mission was finished. Humming happily to herself, Kirinai left the mission tower. She had a daughter to spoil and a team to train. She could inquire into Ikigo's mysterious background later. Karin followed Sekura into the woman's office. This was her fourth day shadowing Sekura at the hospital. From what she had seen so far, it wasn't that different from Uncle Ryukin's hospital back in Karakura town though with the advantage of chakra healing there were more recovery wards and fewer operation theaters. Probably more like 4th division in Seoul society then. Not that Karin had ever been or that she would ever have the chance to go now. The medic Nin's office was a happy combination of messy and perfectly clean that Karin had appreciated from the start. Every scrap of patient information was neatly filed in clearly labeled file cabinets. The in and out trays on her desk were always about even when it came to paperwork, and there was not a speck of dirt anywhere. Everything else was a bit of a toss-up. The shelves that weren't bursting with medical texts were filled with bizarre mementos that Sekura had collected or patients had given her over the years. Karin was particularly amused by the weapons mixed in with more ordinary gifts, but she would get used to it soon enough. There was a tiny table shoved into one corner with a sign that read ongoing research. Do not touch the surface of which was covered in a jumbled mess of scrolls, books, and handwritten notes. There were extra supplies everywhere else, gloves, sterile syringes, bandages, tongue depressors, and two extra lab coats for when Sakura had to change after a messy patient. Not to mention the room was tiny. Between the table, the desk, and two chairs, one for Sakura, one for visitors, there was almost no floor space. On bad days, Karin might call the office claustrophobic. It did have a door that kept out most of the noise, which was sometimes the best a person could ask for. Karin had asked why Sakura's office was so small when she was so important to the hospital. I'm not really there that much, she had said. I usually go out in the field while Shishu and Shizun do administrative things. All the hands-on research has to be done in the labs anyway. I have a private space down there too. Karin hadn't been invited into the labs yet, and she understood why. There were dangerous things in hospital labs, poisons, toxic chemicals, infectious diseases, and blood samples from all sorts of people. All of those could be found in normal laboratories. A shinobi-run hospital had to be worse. She would have to prove herself with simpler tasks before being allowed in there. Sekura gestured for her to sit in the extra chair, which Karin took gratefully. She thought she was in good shape, but academy lessons in the morning followed by hospital rounds in the afternoon were taking their toll. She hadn't been so grateful tomorrow was the weekend in years. The pink-haired medic Nin watched her intently. What do you think, so far? So far Karin hadn't done very much. Most of what she did do was follow Sekura around and hand her things when she asked for them. The few exceptions usually involve holding down uncooperative patients and cleaning up puke though she had been given the opportunity to diagnose a few simple cases in the walk-in clinic. 
It's mostly the same as any other major hospital, said Karin. More weapons injuries and the healing techniques you use are different, but other than that, virtually identical. Is that so? Asked Sakura. Karin wondered how she had given the wrong answer. Konoha has the most advanced hospital in the elemental countries. Our close relationship with Suna means theirs is catching up. And after the alliance during the Fourth Shinobi War, we made recommendations to the other major hidden villages, but they're still learning. Karin stared. Medicine had made huge advances in the past hundred years back on Earth, but the understanding of germ theory and the body was equally advanced here as far as she could tell from her studies. It was hard to believe that Konoha had the only hospital of this quality in the elemental countries. We're only so advanced because of Tsunade Shishu's insistence. She revolutionized the field of medicine and the requirements for Medic Nin. We were making poisons for centuries, but cures are a new development, explained Sekura. I see, said Karin. But she didn't really. What about civilian hospitals? Civilian hospitals? Asked Sekura in surprise. There aren't any. We treat our civilians here, but most people make do with local herbalists, or traveling healers or occasionally a retired medic nin. The upper classes are different of course, they have the money to pay for trained doctors. The only other hospitals are military ones for the daimyo's regular forces. I guess that's what it's like in Seoul society, said Karin. But back dot 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 I in Karakura, everywhere else really, it's different. Sekura's gaze was thoughtful, her green eyes steady as they watched Karin. She let the silence stretch. Anxiety grew in Karin's chest, a low ache that made her feel helpless. She twisted her fingers in the edge of her red shirt. She never used to be anxious like this. She wanted to kick something. Tomorrow's soccer game with Ikigo could not come soon enough. You never call it home, said Sakura eventually. The words were like a physical blow. Karin reeled in her seat, but she recovered. She could take worse. She had taken worse in the past. When we left, Ikigo said we could never go back and be safe. Karakura, Japan, none of it is home anymore. So Yuzu and I thought it would be easier if we didn't use that word for those places. Kano Hagakure is our new home, said Karin. Sekura looked sad. I could never imagine leaving Konoha. Shishu left for years, but she wanted to leave because there were so many hurtful memories. Sekura felt silent lost in her own thoughts. Then, after a moment, she straightened in her seat. I wanted to discuss the techniques you adapted, she said earnestly. Karin blinked. Talk about conversational whiplash. But she latched onto the new topic happily enough. Anything was better than what they had been discussing before. What would you like to know? Asked Karin. Which techniques did you adapt specifically? Asked Sakura pulling out a pen and paper. Blood replenishing. Toxin elimination in the blood. Toxin elimination in the lungs. Muscle repair. Bone alignment. And defibrillation. Rattled off Karin. I know some others that I couldn't adapt. And the kidu for restoring Riyatsu since that's basic and will work on anyone. Sekura paused in her note-taking. You mentioned before that healing jutsu, kidu, was it. Or only completely effective on people from soul society. Why is that, exactly? It has to do with the nature of people from soul society, said Karin awkwardly. She sighed. I'm not sure that I can tell you about it. I'll need to talk to Ikigo and Yuzu about it. And Naruto. He was Sekura's teammate. He would know how she would react. But isn't your father from Soul Society? Continued Sakura. Wouldn't the Kidu affect you? What does that mean exactly Kidu? Dad's from Soul Society originally, said Karin addressing the first question first. But we're from Karakura, like mom, which makes us different. If mom had gone to live in Soul Society, well, that probably wouldn't be possible in their situation. Sakura nodded in understanding because their people were traditionally enemies. That's part of it, said Karin quickly. As for Kidu, she crossed her arms and scowled. There was so much about Kidu and various spells. Ikigo knew much more than her having been thoroughly drilled in the matter by Kyukaku and Anohana. But Sakura-sensei was more interested in the healing aspects, which Karin knew enough about to get by. She straightened in her chair. Kidu are generally understood to be spells though some people refer to them as the demon arts, explained Karin. There are three types, Bakudo, Hado, and Kaido, which are defensive, support type, offensive, attack type, and healing spells respectively. Bakudo and Hado can be used against anyone. The Kaido are a little trickier since they were developed for use on people from Soul Society. Ikigo knows a lot more than me. Anohana made him learn all the healing Kidu. Who is Anohana? Asked Sakura curiously. Karin froze then leaned nonchalant against the back of her seat. Anohana was one of the captains in Soul Society. She's in charge of the 4th Division, the Support Division. Their barracks doubled as the hospital for the rest of the divisions. Sakura noticed her posture. Her pink's brows raised rather pointedly at the false attempt at relaxation. 
but she let it go. Karin hoped Sakura Sensei saw as reluctance to discuss matters involving their exile rather than a reluctance to talk about Shinigami, which is what it really was. Is there a reason she taught your brother rather than you? Asked Sakura. She knew Ikigo, said Karin bluntly. I'm not sure how much the captains really knew about me and Yuzu other than that we existed and Ikigo got upset when we were in danger. We only saw them a handful of times. As for her reasons, I'm not exactly sure. Ikigo was never very good at helping in the clinic, but all he'd say about Anohana was that she was a maniac. I can ask if you want. Sakura waved a hand. That's all right. I was just curious. I can ask him myself later. Now, you said the kid who for restoring Riyatsu works on everyone unlike the other healing spells. Why is that? Everyone has Riyatsu, said Karin. But not everybody. Not everybody was made of Ryurioku like the Shinigami in Soul Society. When the living traveled to Soul Society, their physical bodies were converted to spiritual matter. It didn't kill them because they used Urahara's special gate, and in that form healing Kidu were perfectly effective. In the living world, they had to use Oriheim's special powers or regular first aid until Karin worked out her converted spells. The only exception was Ikigo, who fought in Shinigami, and as a result could be treated with conventional Kidu. Everyone has Riyatsu, repeated Karin because that was all she could say without consulting her siblings. Sekura looked curious. If that's the case, could you use that one on me? Would it hurt anything? Karin blinked and studied Sakura. It took more effort to feel Riyatsu in a living body than that of a Shinigami, or a hollow unless the human had a lot of spiritual energy. Sakura, along with most of the shinobi she had encountered, had more than enough spiritual power, but they never used it as far as Karin could tell. No, said Karin slowly, it should be fine. It won't do anything if your Riyatsu levels are normal though. Try anyway, said Sakura. Okay. Karin got out of her seat and circled around the desk. Sakura swiveled around in her chair. Curiosity burned in her eyes. Do I need to do anything? Asked Sakura. No, said Karin. I just need to touch your head. Technically, she could touch anywhere, but she would feel silly just holding Sakura's hand. Ikigo claimed Anohana had performed the technique without touching him at all. Karin thought that when she reached a thousand years old, she could probably do it without touching too. She just needed a few more centuries of practice. Karin concentrated and converted her Riyatsu to healing energy. Unlike other Kidu, healing spells required no chance to activate or use, simply will, and the appropriate pattern passed on by another healer. Green light bloomed around her hands. It's the same color as healing chakra, said Sakura. Riyatsu is colored by your intent. Healing is always green, said Karin her focus never wavering. I'm going to touch you now. She reached out and touched the tips of her fingers to Sakura's temples. The kid who took hold. Startled by the reaction, Karin blinked while Sakura let out a little breath of surprise. Can you feel that? Asked Karin. Yes, said Sakura excitement and wonder coloring her tone. It feels a lot like killing intent but not. Obviously. Is it working? Killing intent. Muttered Karin in disbelief. In a more normal tone, she said, You must have done something today that used Riyatsu. Otherwise nothing would have happened. I was working in the labs this morning, said Sakura. I was distilling antidotes. Karin scowled that wouldn't cause anyone to use their Riyatsu. Unless, did you use a ninjutsu for that? It's standard procedure unless chakra interferes with the solution, said Sakura slipping into lecture mode. I'll give you a scroll on it. A handful of ingredients are chakra sensitive, so you have to be very careful when working with those otherwise the antidote you're attempting to make will turn out to be a poison or worse, completely useless. Shinobi are weird, Karin told her. Normal people prefer a useless solution to a poisonous one. Sekura's smile was accompanied by a wrinkled nose, but her amusement was genuine and unoffended. You're a shinobi now too. A pre-genin medic nin, said Karin solemnly. I hear them recited in the halls. The kids like it because it rhymes. The adults like it because it rhymes too, said Sekura. They just have the excuse of being high on pain medication. And you'll be able to drop the pre when you graduate from the academy. That won't be too long. Aruka says you're doing well. The kid who cut out abruptly, its task complete. Sekura's Riyatsu was back to peak levels. Karin lowered her hands and took a step back, ignoring the elation and heart that came from the compliment, and correctly executing a healing kidu. Karin reached out her spiritual awareness to poke at her sensei. She could feel a tiny difference in Sekura's Riyatsu, but the effect was very small. It worked, she announced, that kidu only affects Riyatsu, but Ikigo thinks chakra and Riyatsu are related somehow. So using chakra depleted your Riyatsu a bit. Sekura raised a hand to her head to briefly brush at her temples. My chakra level is the same. 
It just affects your Riyatsu, repeated Karin. Sekira rolled her eyes. So I heard. She paused. I do feel better. Less tired. But I don't feel different physically. Karin thought about it for a moment. Chakra is made up of two energies, right? Physical and mental. You think Riyatsu is mental energy? Asked Sekira. It's definitely related, said Karin. And it makes more sense than killing intent. Killing intent is a very important tool for a shinobi, said Sakura reclining in her chair now that exercise was over. It clearly wasn't a chair made for lounging, but Karin understood the importance of image. Once you're started on rounds, you might have to deal with shinobi that do not want to be here. In extreme cases, that involves killing intent. We'll have to find a time to expose you. I've been attacked by Hollow. They're all about killing intent, said Karin dryly. Oh, asked Sakura. Karin wasn't sure if her sensei knew about Hollow, but that wasn't the point of the story. And what did you do? Usually I hit them in the head with a soccer ball, said Karin. Ikigo took care of the really dangerous ones, but she didn't need to say that. All Hollow were dangerous. Sakura threw back her head and laughed. Well, we're not allowed to throw balls at patients, but I might be willing to make an exception. She gave few more chuckles then moved on to business. For the rest of the day, I want you to help out at the front desk and familiarize yourself with our system. I have some more scrolls for you to study on the weekend, including the one about chakra-sensitive ingredients. I want you to practice drawing chakra into different parts of your body. Bury the amounts too. On Monday, Sekira trailed off. Her eyes glittered as she considered future possibilities. The devious grin was especially worrying. On Monday, prompted Karin. On Monday, I'll evaluate your chakra control and taijutsu ability, said Sakura. The grin broadened into a smirk. Then the fun will start. Why do I get the feeling you really mean pain when you say fun? Asked Karin. To quote Shishu, you've got a brain in that skull of yours, and you know how to use it, said Sakura. Now, you've got your standing orders. Hop to it. Karin saluted, as was only appropriate for a pre genin medic nin in training, and trotted out of the office. She would remember in the future that using the Riyatsu restoring Kidu energized Shinobi in an interesting way. Ikigo would be happy to add her discoveries to his working theory on Riyatsu chakra relations. It might even make up for asking to tell another person about soul society. Just one more couldn't hurt. Kakashi considered his options carefully. A hawkage had assigned him to the village for the time being ostensibly to lend his tracking experience to the search for the kidnappers. But in reality, she wanted another pair of eyes on Naruto's cousins. Tsunade trusted the Kurosakis and she trusted Naruto's opinion of them, but she didn't know much about them. Kakashi had plenty of reasons to observe them as one of Naruto's valued companions and as a lead investigator into the kidnappings. Regarding the kidnappers, there was not much to be found. The bizarre, liquefied remains held no clues to their identities. The captured missing Nin had no valuable information about his client. The money that the cart drivers had accepted as a bribe, an act he was sure they deeply regretted, was untraceable. There wasn't even a scent trace to be found outside the Kurosaki's apartment. None of his dogs had been able to find anything nor had any of the Inuzuka's hounds. In light of that and the continued report of all clear from ANBU stationed around the village, Kakashi was at loose ends. He had three choices, Ikigo, Karin, or Yuzu. If there was an attempted kidnapping of Yuzumaki, one of those three, rather than Naruto or Tsunade, was a more likely target. Ikigo had spent the morning training with Team 3, today Kuranai was introducing him to the first of the basic jutsu learned at the academy, and now they were probably running a D-rank mission. Kakashi had had enough of watching Genin complain about D-ranks with his own team, so he would have to pass. Kuranai was a competent Jounin, and had gotten even scarier since her child was born, so Ikigo would be fine. He could track down Karin at the hospital. But it was the hospital, not a comforting place for any shinobi much less one who was injured as frequently as Kakashi. Not to mention Sakura was there. And while he loved his all of cute little genin and was proud of their accomplishments as the next generation of Sanin, he did not particularly want to be subject to the rounds of tests and vaccinations he knew the pink-haired medic nin would force on him should he show up without an ironclad argument against. That left Yuzu, who was learning T and I's specialized brand of Teijutsu from Anko somewhere in Training Ground 40. He had introduced the two primarily for his own amusement. He had not expected that Yuzu was genuinely interested in joining the interrogation squad or that Anko would take such a shine to the girl. Their personalities didn't clash as much as they existed in completely separate realities. Still, Yuzu's display in the Dango shop had been impressive to say the least. No one had been expecting that, especially not from her. 
decision made. Kakashi adjusted his hit I-8 and set out for training ground 40. Technically, he didn't need to cover that eye anymore. Thanks to Obito's gift, he could use Sharingan in both eyes and turn them both off. But he had trained with one eye closed since he was a teenager. It was part of his look. And sometimes, well, he forgot he could turn off the Sharingan in that eye and turned one or both back on. Sekura had been furious the first time he gave himself chakra exhaustion that way. Naruto, once he was sure Kakashi would recover, had laughed himself sick. Sasuke had been completely unsympathetic, but at least he was there to be unsympathetic. Kakashi had the memory of a completely boring afternoon lodged in his psyche forever, but he also had the memory of the reunited Team 7 standing at his bedside, and later Sai and Yamato stopping by to check in on their senpai, to make up for it. In any event, the eye stayed covered as a precaution unless he was in battle or training. He was fairly certain Abida wouldn't be offended. Using his nose, it didn't take long for Kakashi find his targets. Anko smelled like snakeskin and Midarashi Dango, a combination that was impossible to forget. Yuzu smelled a lot like hot ash, which he initially assumed was a result of her enthusiasm for cooking but now he wasn't so sure, and a variety of unfamiliar scents that were shared by her siblings, indicative of life in Karakura. To Kakashi's surprise, the two women were being observed by Morino Ibaki. He touched down next to the dark presence that was the head of the torture and interrogation squad and started to ask about his presence. Instead, the words caught in his throat and he gaped. Ibaki was an intimidating man, dressed in black from head to toe, solidly built, and taller than average with terrible scars on his face and worse ones hidden beneath his clothes. Every inch of Ibaki was purposefully designed to menace. Perched on his shoulder, completely ruining the effect, was the stuffed lion doll, Khan. The toy, seeing Kakashi's stare, waved a tiny paw in greeting. Something for you, Kakashi? Asked Ibaki sounding far too amused. Aren't you a security risk? Asked the S-ranked copy Nin. It was all he could think to say. Nope, said Khan. No brain, can't be probed, no nerves, can't be tortured, and nobody thinks of pumping a doll for information, explained Ibaki. That didn't preclude the possibility of emotional manipulation. But as Ibaki said, no one would ever think of interrogating a doll. The closest thing the elemental countries had to something like Khan was soon as puppets but, barring exceptions like Sesori, none of those possessed a consciousness. But why? Asked Kakashi as slowly reeled in his lost lines of thought. I'm here for moral support, said Khan proudly. There was a cry and a thump. Yuzu, who had been practicing a hold, lost control of Anko and ended up face down in the dirt. In less than a minute she was back on her feet listening intently as the older Kanoichi outlined the reasons for her failure. Yuzu didn't even seem to notice the blood streaming from her nose so strong was her focus. For Yuzu, asked Kakashi dubiously. For Ikigo, admitted Khan. He gave Yuzu the okay, but he is not happy about it. Not about Karin either. I was with her yesterday. Kakashi remembered. Sekura had sent a message to Tsunade from the hospital and included Khan at Karin's insistence. The doll had been able to direct the team containing Kakashi, Naruto, and two additional ANBU straight to Ikigo's location. Tsunade Sama thinks the boy might do something rash if his sisters are in significant danger, said Ibaki. The doll is a compromise. It can report to Ikigo without revealing our specific techniques. I'm a guy, not an it. I'm a guy and my name is Khan, protested the doll. Kakashi almost looked down to verify Khan's claims but managed to restrain himself. He knew there wasn't anything to see. He had examined the lion the other day, after the Dango shop incident, back when he thought it was just a doll. Kakashi carefully directed his mind away from that disturbing line of thought and focused on the much more pleasant issue of Ikigo's hang-ups regarding his sisters. He had the impression that overprotective was a mild descriptor for Ikigo. Not that he smothered the twins, but he obviously worried about their safety. A lot, considering the damage Ikigo had managed the other day, with a severely underpowered attack according to Khan, then the Hawkage's decision was prudent. Panicking any of the Kurosakis unnecessarily was probably a bad idea. You might want to consider some trauma therapy for Yuzu, said Kakashi following along those lines. Oh, asked Ibaki. He kept his eyes front following Yuzu's progress but obviously listening to Kakashi. Yuzu had executed the hold correctly and was now trying to direct Anko around the clearing with only mild success. Her current quirks, we'll call them, can be directly attributed to time spent in a prison known as hell, said Kakashi. Is that so? Asked Ibaki. Sounds like a fun place. When was this, exactly? Kakashi directed his gaze to Khan, who was looking anxious and sad. 
The toy was very expressive for a creature with no facial muscles. I'm not sure when exactly, said Khan waving his arms. Life was pretty hectic for a while. More than five years ago, less than eight. Ibuki scowled displeased by the answer. What happened to her? What are the details? Nothing happened to Yuzu, I think, said Khan carefully. They kept her in a cage on the bottom level until Ikigo broke in and got her out. She was unconscious for most of the time too, so I don't know how much she remembers. They've never really talked about it. I'm surprised the brother didn't put her in therapy before now, said Ibuki. He seems the type. Khan shrugged. She escaped from hell. The only people who would believe that were in Soul Society, and Ikigo didn't want any extra attention on Yuzu for something like that. Besides, nobody knew Yuzu was affected until a few years later when she busted out the chains on some guy messing with her and Karin. Kakashi and Ibuki exchanged unhappy looks. Sometimes Keke Genkai manifested under stressful conditions. The sharing in was a prime example. Assault would definitely count. Kakashi redirected his attention to Yuzu and Anko. The girl had stopped trying to hurt Anko, and they were in the middle of a sparring match. Yuzu was supposed to find a way to grab her opponent in the hold when Anko was trying to resist. Hanko wasn't going at top speed, but that would come later after Yuzu got the feel of things. Why would Ikigo want to keep Yuzu away from the eyes of Soul Society if it meant she could get help? Asked Kakashi. His conflict with them only happened recently, right? Khan snorted. He couldn't possibly have sinuses in that stuffed body, but the sound was completely realistic. Yeah, turning on Ikigo was new, which tells you the central chambers aren't exactly reasonable. Somebody might have got the idea that since Yuzu ended up in hell once, she deserved to be there, explained Khan. But she was a kidnap victim, a teenager, protested Ibuki. Kakashi had killed a handful of children in his service as a shinobi, but he had always tried to make it quick. Ibuki might have needed to interrogate a few, possibly even use torture, though children rarely needed that much encouragement to talk. But Kanoha took fewer of those missions than any other hidden village. They were the most prosperous village. They could afford to spare their shinobi some pain. Soul Society, as far as Kakashi understood it, was a completely normal government like the daimyo's court. A civilian court could never approve torturing a child without facing public outcry. Unless, of course, it was a common practice. Hell is hell, said Khan. It doesn't matter how you get there. Everyone is guilty. Everyone is a lifer. There were probably kids and they're younger than Yuzu, even if Ikigo didn't mention seeing any. Might need a psych eval on the brother too, noted Ibuki. Kakashi inclined his head. I'll mention it to Tsunade Sama, not Haruno, asked Ibuki. Isn't she training the other one? Kakashi grinned beneath his mask. Sekura said if I ended up in the hospital again, she'd make sure I would never leave. Ibuki huffed. You know that's not what she meant. Ma, ma, best not to risk it, said Kakashi. Yuzu had managed to catch Anko at least once, but the Kanoichi had broken free almost immediately. They were back to sparring again, but Yuzu didn't appear disappointed just determined. If the girl was unconscious the whole time, it doesn't explain how her stint in hell managed to give her quirks, said Ibuki idly. He directed a look at the lion on his shoulder. Do you know? Or should I ask her brother? Khan whimpered. Don't ask Ikigo. And surprised Kakashi got away with it last time. The doll crossed his arms and assumed a thinking pose. His little tail twitched back and forth in displeasure. Kakashi left Toy alone to ruminate and instead watched the women practice. Yuzu had finally caught Anko and held her. She was frog marching the Kanoichi around the training ground. Anko's proud smirk was clear despite the occasional wince. After a full circle of the area, Yuzu dropped her hold and they started over. Hell has a bad atmosphere, said Khan eventually. It infected Yuzu while she was there. You can see it when she calls her chains. All that red light. Ibuki's scowl was out in full force. He could give the Hawkage monument a run for its money. His face might as well have been granite. I take it you're not talking about air quality. Khan hesitated prompting Kakashi to review what he knew already about the Kurosakis. They were willing to talk about anything from their homeland except its location, and the exact nature of the powers used by the forces of Soul Society. Kakashi could understand the sentiment. Fortunately, he had heard most of Ikigo's explanations to Tsunade and was good at piecing things together. You mean, the Ryayatsu of the place was bad, said Kakashi carefully like the empty districts polluted by Nine Tails Chakra. Khan nodded, worry shone from his black button eyes. We tried building a prison in one of those areas ten years ago, said Ibuki frowning. But the Chakra drove the prisoners insane during the initial trials. The guards too. Tell me there's a sane shinobi anywhere. I promise I won't laugh, said Khan with clear bravado. The toy had a point. Compared to most people, shinobi were insane. 
but there was a difference between normal, everyday crazy and Kyubai-driven madness. They had lost quite a few shinobi trying to clear those districts before the third declared them off limits. But Ikigo's not infected, clarified Kakashi. He can counter the technique Yuzu learned there. He learned to do that from the guards, said Khan. But that was later. At the beginning, the atmosphere upset him too. He had a hard time keeping control of his temper. But Ikigo has a lot of Riyatsu, so he could push back. Yuzu's power hadn't developed yet. She was vulnerable, and she ended up chained up too, which made it worse. With the chains that track people, said Kakashi recalling Ikigo's explanation. Right, said Khan. That's what really messed her up. They sink into your Riyatsu. Is that going to affect Anko? Asked Ibuki. Or any of the prisoners she'll be interrogating? Ask no, said Khan hesitantly. They're not the same sort of chain. They are, what did you call them, chakra constructs. They only look the same. Probably for the best, said Ibuki. But it was clear his thoughts were divided on the matter. That would be a useful skill for any prison guard. Louder, he said. Wrap it up, you two. It's getting late. Sunade sama doesn't want you screwing around after dark. There were cheerful cries of acknowledgement from Anko and Yuzu, though Yuzu's was actually cheerful while Anko's was closer to Manic. Kakashi returned his full attention to Ibuki. How's she doing? Asked Kakashi. Ibuki actually grinned. The effect was, as usual, deeply disquieting. Girls got talent. No mistake. She's clearing the usual mind games like they were nothing. She's a hard worker too. Sometimes newbies slack off when they don't have a background in the business, thinks it keeps their hands clean. But she jumps right in. Nice to see some spunk. Ibuki had claimed Anko had spunk once upon a time. Kakashi was dismayed. But she's so nice, said Kakashi. Hellish chakra chains and unfortunate experiences aside, nice was Yuzu's dominant personality trait. You're the one who recommended her to Anko, said Ibuki cheekily. Nice might throw off the prisoners though. Wait until they hear she escaped from hell. Ha. Huh? Ibuki's laughter was as disturbing as his smile. But, on the plus side, Kakashi won his bet with Guy about how Ibuki would react to Yuzu's incarceration. That put in him back in the lead of their personal competition. We're ready, said Anko landing next to the other shinobi with a flourish. Hello, Morino-san, Kakashi-san, said Yuzu following more slowly behind her. Is everything well? Coated in dirt from head to toe, Yuzu's green jacket and gray apron were a uniform brown. Blood had dried down her face from her earlier nosebleeds. She looked nothing like the tidy homemaker that Kakashi had met just a week ago. Despite her rough appearance, she was a smiling. It was a broad, happy grin that Kakashi had only seen on a handful of people. Guy, for one. Naruto, for another. Kakashi could see how the two were related when she was smiling like that. Just doing some follow-up, said Ibuki dismissively. You're Anko's first student, after all. But Anko-san is a good teacher and so much fun said Yuzu earnestly. Kakashi could tell she meant it. The other two were in tea they could tell she meant it too. Good teacher wasn't surprising. Anko did a lot of work culling out new recruits for Ibuki. On the other hand, Anko and Fun usually required some modifier like scary or painful or when drunk to make the claim stick. Yuzu said fun and meant fun, no qualifier necessary. Anko's expression cartwheeled through a variety of emotions, most of which Kakashi was too polite to identify. She slung an arm around Yuzu's neck and crushed her to her chest. Anko was still wearing her metal mesh, so it had to hurt, but Yuzu didn't even whimper. She's adorable. I'm keeping her, she announced. You already said that, replied Kakashi. Just restaking my claim, said Anko. Kakashi rolled his eyes, and people thought he was weird. He had nothing on the shinobi from T and I. Khan jumped from Ibuki's shoulder to Yuzu's head startling Anko into letting go. Yuzu rubbed her cheek. There was a distinct chain link pattern pressed into her skin but not so much as a scratch. The group waited for Khan to get situated, hanging from Yuzu's shoulder, feet bouncing against her back, before starting back toward the village proper. Yuzu didn't know how to tree jump like her brother, so it was slow going. Kakashi was checking up on you, said Khan matter-of-factly. Yuzu grinned brightly. Is that right, Kakashi-san? Anko's mutter of I called dibs was ignored by everyone. I'm looking into the kidnappers, explained Kakashi. That means checking on all of you. He thought Yuzu's smile dimmed a fraction at the mention of the kidnappers, but she restored it quickly. Have you found anything? Asked Yuzu. Investigations are ongoing, said Kakashi. Anko leaned in and stage whispered, that means no. Kakashi pouted, completely hidden by the mask, and turned to Ibuki. Have you found anything? Ibuki scowled. Investigations are ongoing. Yuzu giggled. She didn't seem that concerned by the kidnappers after all. Then again, escorted by three jounin, Anko had cried when she finally got to drop the tokubetsu from her title, something else Kakashi was too polite to mention, 
Yuzu probably felt perfectly safe. Khan, however, had more to say. He came here instead of checking on Karin in the hospital because he was afraid of Sakura-sensei. Kakashi choked. Yuzu's expression turned morose. Ibuki and Anko watched waiting to see how the situation would resolve. Oh no, Kakashi-san, are you avoiding the hospital? You really should keep up with your physical appointments, said Yuzu with concern. It's important to your health. She looked so disappointed. Kakashi gamely ignored the snickers from Anko and the smirk from Ibuki. I'll work on that right away, said Kakashi. He was famous for running late. Right away could be months from now. It's important to your health, Kakashi-san, said Yuzu, her voice gone flat. Kakashi burst into a cold sweat. He could feel it trickling down his spine. He knew he would never be able to make fun of Yamato for capitulating to a civilian girl ever again. I'll work on that right away, Yuzu-san, he said, and he meant it. He really, really meant it. Great, said Yuzu brightly. The terrible feeling vanished as her smile returned. I'll tell Karin, and Sakura-sensei can set up an appointment for you really soon. As Anko heaped praises on Yuzu for being a natural and Ibuki silently radiated approval at his department's soon-to-be newest member, Kakashi mourned quietly. However much Yuzu was related to Naruto, she was clearly equally related to Tsunade with her unnecessary concern for a poor, put upon Shinobi's health. While Kakashi could withstand any number of beatings to stay out of the hospital, no one could resist that. Insistent indeed. Morning dawned clear and bright over the village hidden in the leaves. The rising sun casting a warm, rosy glow over the slowly waking village. The day promised to be beautiful. The few children up and awake at this hour were excited for the potential day of fun ahead. Games of ninja would erupt all over the village including such staples as rescue the princess, kill the evil warlord, and befriend the nine-tailed fox. The early risers, the bakers, the smiths, a dozen other sundry merchants, looked forward to a day of good sales as the lovely weather promised to bring shoppers to the market. Even the shadows seemed brighter, forcing the shinobi hiding within them to adjust their jinjutsu to match. In his one-bedroom apartment, Yuzumaki Naruto, Kanoha's number one unpredictable noisy ninja and future hawkage, could care less about the rising sun and the weather except as it affected the encroaching soccer game with his newfound cousins. He examined himself in the mirror and shook his head. His current outfit joined the rest of the pile. The pile covered the floor of his room and quite a bit of the hallway. Every piece of clothing Naruto owned was in the pile and some he didn't own, which belonged to his often-away roommate, Sasuke. Naruto would really hate having to pick up all those clothes later, especially Sasuke's, because he could never get the folds quite right, and his friend always knew when Naruto touched his stuff. That was distant, far-off worry because right now Naruto did not know what to wear. They were going to play soccer. Naruto had never even heard of soccer. A last-minute consult with Uruka-sensei was only mildly helpful. He had never heard of soccer either, which Naruto found to be a great disappointment, but Aruka did say Karin had organized her training uniform so that it resembled a soccer uniform. Well, Naruto knew what Karin wore to the academy. He escorted the girls there every day. But how closely should his outfit mimic hers? Did he need to wear red? Should he wear shin guards? Were pants okay or only shorts? Yesterday, Yuzu had said he should wear something comfortable that he could move around in. But should he go for his shinobi outfit or something more casual? The light from outside finally registered. Naruto whipped his head toward the window. If it was light outside, then he could visit Sakura. She was a girl. She always knew what to wear. Naruto zoomed to the front door. Sakura's building was on that side, so it was more practical than leaving through the window. Just before he left, he caught sight of the kitchen clock and skidded to a halt. It was way too early to bother Sakura on a Saturday, especially since she usually pulled a double shift on Friday to deal with all the start of the weekend accidents. Not even Shinobi could escape the embarrassment that was drinking too much on a Friday night. Naruto sighed and closed his eyes. He let his head fall forward to hit the door with a soft thud. They could go, Karin, Yuzu, none of them would care what he was wearing only that he showed up. What he had on now would be fine. He opened his eyes and squinted down at his outfit. Socks, good. The adorable Gama-chan boxers Sai had given him as a gag gift. Okay, nothing else. Bad, 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 bad. He was practically naked. He could not go outside like this. Naruto zipped back into his bedroom so fast that any onlookers might suspect Shunchin was involved. Fortunately for Naruto, there were no onlookers inside the apartment or out. They no doubt would have been laughing at him. A few hours later, Naruto was feeling much better after his morning breakfast of ramen. He was walking over to the Kurosaki's apartment dressed in perfectly normal orange t-shirt and dark blue shorts. He was dressed as a civilian today, so he had left his forehead protector at home. 
As a result, his hair was falling down into his eyes. He would have to cut it again soon, he mused. At the apartment, Naruto knocked tentatively on the door. Karin had taken the opportunity earlier in the week to explain exactly what would have happened had he knocked on the door the first time. Kirama had told him that he could have revived Naruto even from an attack like that. Naruto was pretty sure the old fox was full of hot air since not even Kirama knew anything about Ryayatsu or how it worked. Come in, Naruto, called Yuzu cheerfully. Naruto fished around in his pocket and retrieved the paper key Ikigo had given him. He carefully wrapped it around the doorknob and twisted. There was a moment of resistance. Naruto could feel it as easily as he could feel the faint aura of menace coming from the door itself. But just as quickly the resistance and the aura faded, and the door swung open easily. Naruto grinned. Awesome, hello, he said as entered the apartment. He didn't move out of the entryway and didn't bother taking off his sandals. He thought they would be leaving right away. Hi, Naruto-san. That was Yuzu. She was carrying a large woven basket toward the door. Instead of her usual gray and green outfit, she was wearing pink hooded sweater vest, a yellow skirt, and black leggings. Her light brown hair was held back from her face by a strawberry hair clip. In addition to the basket, the straps of a small yellow backpack were slung across one shoulder. Good morning, Yuzu-san, said Naruto. Do you need some help? Yuzu huffed. You and Ikainai, such gentlemen, she said teasingly. No, thank you. I'm working on my stamina. Sup, Naruto. That was Karin. She was wearing her training outfit, after all. Naruto squinted. No, it was a little different. There was white writing on the shirt, and it was made of a different, shinier material that Naruto didn't recognize. Her black shorts were virtually identical, but the shin guards, which she wore over tall socks, were very different and looked a lot more modern than the usual Kayahan. Her hair was pulled back into a short tail, and she was carrying a black and white patterned ball under one arm. Hey, Ikigo appeared behind his sisters. Instead of his training outfit, he wore a black long-sleeved shirt with a few vertical red stripes for decoration. He wore shorts too, and Naruto spotted gloves sticking out of his pocket. He wore tall socks like Karin's, but they looked strange to Naruto's eyes. It took him a moment to realize they weren't the tabai he was used to seeing. A glance at the entranceway revealed several pairs of closed-toed shoes. They were unfamiliar designs, shoes the Kurosakis had brought from Japan. Naruto looked at his own open-toed sandals. Should I have brought my winter toe covers? He asked in concern. All three siblings looked down at his feet. We can just play barefoot, said Karin with a shrug. It's not like Dad packed my cleats. If there's a place where we won't trip over some hidden traps, corrected Ikigo. Naruto brightened. We can use the training ground where Team 7 practices. Is everyone ready? Where's Khan? Yuzu leaned in conspiratorially. He's sleeping in this morning. He's not used to getting up so early, poor thing. She shifted her basket. We're ready to go, Naruto-san. Naruto wasn't sure how a doll could sleep much less sleep in, but he had learned not to question the bizarre characteristics of the lion toy. Instead he led the Kurosaki out of the apartment and toward the training grounds. On the way, he asked, ever so casually, how one went about playing soccer. Karin launched into an explanation of the rules, the penalties, the requirements of the sport, and a description of the evolution of the game so thorough and complex that Naruto's head was spinning after only five minutes. When they finally reached the training ground, she was still going and only stopped to examine the playing field. I don't. Naruto cut himself off. A lack of understanding was not sufficient to describe the aching pain in his head as he tried to recall a thousand little details. I'm sorry, Naruto-san, said Yuzu. Karin-chan really likes soccer. I could tell, admitted Naruto. Not that it helped him understand anything. Ikigo heaved a sigh. You and Karin will be on opposite teams. You'll want to kick the ball into the goal to score a point. You can use any part of your body other than your hands to direct the ball. I'll be goalie and try to stop both of you from scoring. Unnecessary roughness usually results in a foul, but you two will probably end up play a little rough. Just don't break anything. That was simple enough. He looked at Yuzu. You're not playing. Yuzu had spread out a large blanket a little ways away and was unpacking her backpack. She had a few scraps of cloth and a needle and thread. She shook her head. I like to watch. I'll be the cheering squad. All right, said Naruto. He looked back to Ikigo. So where's the goal? How big is it? Ikigo gestured at one side of the training grounds. Over there, probably. So the trees can stop the ball before it goes too far. He pitched his voice louder. How big is a normal soccer goal? Karin. 2 and 44 hundredths meters by 7 and 32 hundredths meters, called Karin from the center of the field. She had sat down to strip off her shoes and socks and after a moment of indecision shucked the shin guards too. Ikigo looked at Naruto. 
You're just going to have to imagine it. No problem, said Naruto. He formed a series of hand seals and a pair of pillars the appropriate height and distance apart shot from the ground. Karin released a loud whoop of approval while Ikigo and Yuzu both looked impressed. Yuzu even gave a small round of applause. Why are the numbers so weird? He asked Ikigo as they started to stretch. It's really 8 feet by 24 feet, but the Americans are the only ones who use that measuring system, said Ikigo. Americans, asked Naruto, is that another place back on your world? Ikigo nodded. There's North America and South America, which are continents. But I was talking about the United States of America, which is a country. Naruto stared. The elemental countries existed on one, single continent and the surrounding islands. The idea of two continents was huge. It was even stranger than the idea of soul society. Naruto knew there was an afterlife. He had even fought people from beyond the grave though not in the same way as Ikigo. How many? Asked Naruto. How many what? Asked Ikigo. How many continents? How many countries? Asked Naruto. Ikigo blinked. There are seven continents, but people only live on six. Antarctica is at the very bottom of the world, so it's too cold. As for countries, the last count was 196, I think. Right, Yuzu? The official number is 195, since not everybody accepts Taiwan as a country. But there are some wars in other parts of the world where people want new countries, so it might change a little, said Yuzu. Yuzu watched a lot of news, explained Ikigo, so she's more up to date on that sort of thing than me. It's important to keep up with current events, Ikai Nyai, said Yuzu. Ikigo just rolled his eyes and kept stretching. Naruto went through the moves automatically. His mind was still caught up in the idea of seven continents and almost 200 countries. It was hard to imagine. It was so completely different from what Naruto was used to. How many people? Asked Naruto. In Japan or everywhere? Asked Ikigo. Both, said Naruto quickly. Ikigo took a minute to think. Japan's population is just over 125 million. The Earth, a little less than 8 billion. Why? Is this some hawkage thing? Yes, said Naruto automatically because the hawkage did need to have an estimate of each country's population. Secretly, Naruto only kept from panicking because of his experience as a shinobi. The entire population of the elemental countries, as he knew it, was just over 700 million. The population of the Earth was more than 10 times that amount. He looked at his cousins. Despite the huge population, one that a shinobi could lose himself in and never be found by anyone friend or foe, Ikigo and his sisters still felt the need to leave their world completely. That wouldn't be happening here. Not on his watch. Karin sauntered up, soccer ball balanced on one hip, and a victorious grin on her face. Are you ready, Naruto? Naruto leapt to his feet. Bring it on. Karin had outlined how far they were allowed to go before they were considered out of bounds. Yuzu was sitting about a meter and a half back from the line on that side of the field. The center of goal Naruto had made was the center line. Then the same distance again on the other side stopping just short of the pond Naruto had fallen into during the bell test. Lengthwise, they would only be playing a half field, but it still took up most of the training ground. Standing in front of the goal, Ikigo was holding the ball in his hands. He had put on the gloves, also a fetching shade of black, that Naruto had noticed earlier. You ready? He called. Ready, said Naruto. Karin flashed her brother a thumbs up. Go, Karin. Go, Naruto, shouted Yuzu from the sidelines. Ikigo pitched the soccer ball into the air. Naruto and Karin raced toward the ball. Naruto headed for its approximate landing spot. He was ninja. He knew these things, but Karin ran ahead. She jumped into the air and head-butted the ball into the turf. She landed on her feet and took control of the ball racing down the field toward the goal before Naruto knew what happened. Naruto charged after her with the spare thought that it might have been a good idea to bring his hit aid after all. He planned to kick the ball out from under her, but once he caught up, she started guarding it between her feet. He circled around her trying to find a way to get the ball back, but she knew all the tricks for keeping it out of his reach. After one particularly impressive duck-twist combination, Karin hauled back her foot and kicked the ball toward the goal. Naruto watched it sail for the goal posts at top speed and resigned himself to falling behind in points. But there was a flash of orange and black, and Ikigo was there. The ball bounced off his arms before it could pass through the goals, and Ikigo scooped it up. Nice save, Ikai Nai, yelled Yuzu. Heads up, said Ikigo. He pitched the ball further out away from the goal. Karin and Naruto ran after it. Naruto got there first this time, bouncing it off his chest rather than his head. He kicked the ball in front of him trying to keep it between his feet the way Karin had. One kick went just a little too far, and Karin rushed through like a tempest stealing the ball away from him. Arg! cried Naruto. 
you snooze, you lose, said Karin as she bounded away. Ikigo blocked her next shot too, diving low to the earth and skidding across the dirt ground to reach. Karin recovered the ball, but Naruto wasn't going to sit by and let her attempt to score again. He caught up with her and watched her legs carefully. There was moment when her stride opened just a little wider. Naruto shot his foot out and succeeded in knocking the ball away from her. Unfortunately, they both crashed to the ground with their legs in a tangle. Before Naruto could even attempt to apologize, Karin was scrambling to her feet and charging after the ball. Nice try, Naruto, said Yuzu. Keep it up. Naruto jumped back up and chased after Karin. He couldn't get the ball back before she tried to score. Ikigo made another save, but managed to hold on to it a little longer the next time. They kept going back and forth, sort of. Karin or Naruto starting out with the ball. Karin usually ending with the ball, and Karin attempting to score with ball, though Ikigo had blocked all her shots so far. But Naruto was improving with every attempt. He had almost got dribbling down what Karin called keeping the ball between her feet while moving, and was doing better at stealing, once he even managed without knocking them both down first. Then Naruto saw his shot. The way was clear. Ikigo was the other end of the goal. He took his kick and the ball hurtled down the field straight towards the goal posts. There was no way Ikigo could catch it in time. It passed by the rock pillar dot 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 on the wrong side. Tears of frustration poured from Naruto's eyes. Wide, said Karin. Good kick though. Don't forget to aim next time. Ikigo went to retrieve the ball, which had gone a little way into the tree line after Naruto's failed shot. Naruto took the opportunity to glance at the sidelines where Yuzu was sitting. He had expected to hear something from the other twin. She managed to cheer or commiserate with every move. To his surprise, Kakashi was sitting with Yuzu. Naruto hadn't seen the Jounin arrive, he had been too focused on playing. But that was why they had guards in the first place. Kakashi had orders from Tsunade to check up on all them. Then Naruto noticed the book in his former sensei's hands and froze. He had grown used to it after so many years in the Jounin's presence, not to mention Jureya's. But that little orange book should be nowhere near sweet, innocent Yuzu. Naruto, look out. Naruto turned his head just in time to catch a soccer ball straight to the face. The next thing he knew he was flat on the ground with Karin and Ikigo leaning over him looking concerned. Are you alright? Asked Karin. Naruto blinked a couple of times and sat up. I'm good, he said grinning. It takes more than that to knock me out. A hand appeared in front of his face. It belonged to Ikigo, whose apologetic look covered his whole face. Naruto took it happily letting the other man help him to his feet. Sorry about that, said Ikigo. I was the one not paying attention, said Naruto. And I've got a hard head. Are we going to keep going? Let's take a break and eat something, said Karin. You can rest that hard head of yours for a while. The three soccer players wandered over to Yuzu and Kakashi. Naruto was a little disappointed that they weren't going to keep playing. He was finally starting to get it. But he was cheered by the prospect of a picnic lunch made Yuzu. Then they reached the blanket, and Naruto abruptly remembered why he was distracted in the first place. What are you reading in public? Spluttered Ikigo. Ikigo's face had gone bright red with embarrassment, and he was averting his eyes. Naruto winced and looked at Karin. She just rolled her eyes and dropped to the ground to fish out a bottle of water from the basket. Kakashi just pointed a finger at Ikigo's reaction and tilted his head in Yuzu's direction. Bikaini is just shy, she said brightly. You might want to put your book away for lunch so it doesn't it get dirty. There was an awkward silence while everyone else tried to ignore the obvious. Ikigo's face couldn't possibly get any redder. Naruto was debating the merits of strangling his old sensei. Women everywhere would thank him for it. And Sakura might even give him a medal if she heard. Kakashi, thankfully, slipped Ika Ika Paradise back into the pocket of his vest. Legs stretched out in front of her and leaning back one hand, Karin tilted her water bottle at her sister. You do realize he was reading porn. Yuzu, who was pulling side dish after side dish out her basket, looked mildly confused. Yes, Kakashi-sen said that Naruto's master, Jureya, used to write them. Naruto gave it up for a bad job and flopped onto the blanket next to Karin. She tossed him another bottle of water along with an amused smirk. Ikigo ended up sitting next to Naruto, though he had been a bit too distracted to move smoothly and had jerked and twitched like a damaged puppet as he lowered himself into a seat. I asked Kakashi-san if the series was any good, said Yuzu completely ignoring her brother and passing out paper plates loaded with rice. She even had enough for Kakashi, but I thought he might be biased. What do you think, Naruto-san? You must have read them. Naruto choked on his water. No, I haven't read them. I mean, Iro Senen made me proofread them for him, but I haven't read them read them. So, they're not good. Asked Yuzu ladling curry onto each plate. Naruto shifted uncomfortably in his seat and wished Yuzu would stop asking him about porn. 
No, it's definitely the best series out there. Yuzu turned her attention on Ikigo. You should think about buy a novel or two. Ikainiai, you've been stressed ever since we got here. Taking some time to relax would be good for you. Ikigo groaned and buried his face in his hands. Naruto could only make out a few words, but they were mostly variations on why me. Naruto was just relieved she had moved on to someone else. That's not something you usually think about, said Karin. She looked bored by the situation rather than concerned. I thought it was something daddy might say, explained Yuzu. Dig in, everyone. There's your problem, said Karin reaching for her chopsticks. If Goatface said it, then it's the wrong thing to say. Don't worry, Ikigo, it's just the moron bothering you across the great divide. Itadakamasu, four voices echoed hers. Even Ikigo had managed to straighten up to eat. His face was still red, though not quite as bright as before. At least, Naruto didn't have to worry about his cousin's head exploding. Relieved, Naruto turned his attention to his lunch. The main dish was curry again though a different style than the one they had for dinner last week. But it was still delicious. It was almost as good as Ikaraku ramen, thought Naruto. Almost. Don't worry, Naruto-san. I haven't forgotten about my promise to make you ramen, said Yuzu. She blushed faintly. I've just been a bit too tired to cook this week. She tried about a billion different recipes on us before that though, said Karin. So it'll be good when she makes it. Of course it will, said Naruto. Yuzu-san is the best cook ever. Have you been eating out a lot then if you haven't been able to cook? Asked Kakashi. Keeping up your strength is important when you're training hard every day. Oh no, said Yuzu shaking her head. Ikai Niai cooks for us. He used to do that after mom died before I was old enough to use the stove. It's not as good as Yuzu's cooking. But they don't starve, said Ikigo blandly. Your dad didn't cook for you, asked Naruto hesitantly. To his surprise, all three siblings turned green. He tried, said Yuzu after a moment. But cooking isn't daddy's strong point. Ugh, better to starve than eat that, added Karin. He was doing other stuff anyway, added Ikigo. Funeral arrangements, working at the clinic, making sure we had money to buy food. Just dot 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 not fixing food. Never fixing food. Naruto nodded. It was good that their dad hadn't abandoned them after their mom died, even if the Kurosakis did call him weird names. He had a hard time cooking himself. Other than preparing instant ramen, all Naruto knew was a bit of campfire cooking and whatever Sakura had been willing to show him after he returned from his trip with Jiraiya. Your game was very interesting, said Kakashi. I'm not sure of all the rules, but from what I could tell, Karin was very good. Karin's great at soccer, said Yuzu. She could have been a professional player right out of high school. Karin blushed and hid a pleased smile with her plate. Naruto felt way better about losing in that case. It was impressive that he managed to keep up, and he would do better next time. Oh, asked Kakashi, and Ikigo managed to block all those shots anyway. Ikigo snorted. That's because Karin made me practice with her once the neighborhood kids wised up. Jinto and Yoru still played with us, said Yuzu. And that white-haired boy Karin liked. Yuzu, hissed Karin. We're not talking about that. There was a loud snap. Naruto turned his head to look. Ikigo had broken his chopsticks in half. Sensing where this was going, Naruto scooted out of the line of fire. Kakashi and Yuzu looked on with obvious interest. White-haired boy, asked Ikigo. Taoshiru, Captain Hitsugeya Taoshiru of 10th Division, has been playing soccer with my sister on a regular basis. Naruto, who had just played soccer with Karin, thought maybe he was reading too much into things. Then again, there were quite a few full-body collisions, so maybe Ikigo had a point. It's ironic because daddy was the captain of the 10th before he met mom. Yuzu whispered to Kakashi just loud enough for everyone to hear. The outraged cries of protest from Karin and Ikigo almost deafened Naruto stuck between them as he was. But then he noticed Yuzu's genuine soft smile and the amused twinkle in Kakashi eye. And he took in the sight of the siblings yelling at Yuzu about their father and yelling at each other about this Hitsugeya person and decided that they were having fun. Ikigo waving his hands and making threatening faces, which were more silly than scary, was the most animated he had been so far. Karin's denials were almost as passionate as her soccer game. It was play fighting, he realized. Team 7 had never really done much play fighting. Sekura's punches had eventually changed to love taps, just as hard but with filled affection rather than annoyance but Naruto had never mastered the art of hitting back. His fights with Sasuke always set them as rivals, and maybe it had been friendly competition on Naruto's end. But it had still been real competition. He and Sasuke could spar now as friends, but he knew Sasuke was often haunted by their fight at the Valley of the End. Naruto hoped that if his parents had lived, if he had had other siblings, he could have had this sort of relationship with them. 
one where fighting wasn't always angry or for training but for fun too. Eventually, the two settled down and the rest of the meal continued. The conversation was light, mostly because Yuzu and Kakashi asked easy questions, and she showed off the yukata she had made for Khan during the soccer game. Karin and Ikigo weren't big talkers, Naruto had noticed, and he was happy to listen for a change. For dessert we have Dango, said Yuzu pulling out a box. Ah, we've been having a lot of Dango this week, said Ikigo. It didn't stop him from reaching for a skewer. It's Anko Senpai's favorite shop, said Yuzu. We stop by there every day on the way to the apartment. She really likes Dango. Naruto tried to suppress Snicker with only mild success. Dango was Anko's favorite food. She liked Dango almost as much as Naruto liked ramen. And unlike the cheerful blonde, she could get scary when someone tried to steal a bite. And did Anko tell you to practice on your brother and sister this weekend? Asked Kakashi dryly. She did say I needed to practice, said Yuzu. And Ikai Niai and Karin are fun to wind up. Her siblings choked and sputtered. Naruto threw back his head and roared with laughter. Even Kakashi had a little chuckle. Shortly after that, they were packing up lunch and debating whether or not to try another brief game of soccer when there was movement in the bushes. Naruto caught a glimpse of an ANBU mask but was distracted by an alarmed yelp from Karin. He turned in time to see her drop her ball and kick it at the ANBU. The shinobi moved before it could connect, but the ball made a hole in brush and hit a tree. It took a moment for Naruto to realize he could see through the first tree to the one behind it. What was that? Demanded Naruto. Karin almost took out Ni. Ah, oh, our ANBU guard, said Ikigo idly. You're getting that by the way. I thought it was a hollow, said an embarrassed Karin as she went to retrieve the ball. She shouted a casual sorry. Into the brush. Why did the ANBU remind her of a hollow, did you say? Asked Kakashi. It's the masks, right? Asked Naruto. Ikigo said something similar a few days ago. Hollows wear white masks, confirmed Ikigo. It makes the ANBU a little unnerving. Naruto and Kakashi exchanged a look. There were plenty of reasons why the ANBU were unnerving. The masks were the least among them. Still, Kakashi didn't know that Hollows ate people. If Naruto thought anyone in a white mask wanted him for lunch, well, he'd probably be a little wary around the ANBU too. I've never seen one of them before, said Karin once she returned. Why did he move like that? Ikigo coughed. ANBU-san was probably trying to point out that I had a formal dinner tonight at the Hyuuga compound so another game of soccer was probably a bad idea. Naruto snickered. That would teach Neji to break protocol for something so silly. Naruto glanced at the tree again and that perfectly round hole. It wasn't small being the shape of a soccer ball. Karin could kill a man with an attack like that before the victim ever knew what happened, and she hadn't even hesitated. Those were some sharp reflexes, said Kakashi obviously following a similar train of thought. Karin shrugged. Hollows started showing up at most of my pickup games in high school. I could usually keep them occupied until Ikigo or another Shinigami showed up. Naruto twitched and looked at Kakashi, but the older Jounin just thought that meant a soldier of soul society. He had no reason to be suspicious. Still, Naruto did not approve of the curious expression overtaking Kakashi Sensei's face. So Shinigami and Hollow are on opposite sides, said Kakashi. Is that why they attack your games? Because your father is from Soul Society, and the soldiers there are Shinigami. Silently Naruto despaired his teacher's curiosity. Tsunade hadn't said one way or the other, but no one wanted to throw around terms like evil spirits in the afterlife casually. Naruto knew Kakashi could keep a secret if necessary, but it shouldn't be necessary. However, if Tsunade and Naruto ordered a gag order on questions when Tsunade wanted near constant reports on the Kurosakis, then that would make Kakashi even more suspicious. He might try to find answers without asking questions using methods like sneaking into a booby-trapped apartment. They went after Karin because she has strong Riyatsu, said Ikigo. Hollows are opposed to everybody, even other hollows. Then how is it that you came by hollow powers? Or am I not allowed to ask about that? The hawkage ushered us out very quickly after you brought it up the other day, said Kakashi. Ikigo's whole body stilled. His expression wasn't angry just empty. It was almost worse than anger when compared to how vivid he had been before. Hawkage sama wanted to confirm that despite my hollow abilities I was not inclined toward cannibalism. He said completely ignoring both questions. Naruto could tell that Ikigo favored lies of omission over outright untruths, but an obvious sidestep like that would not stop Kakashi-sensei for long. Still, mentions of cannibalism could throw anyone off track, even the famous copy Nin. Cannibalism, repeated Kakashi. You don't need to worry about that from me, added Ikigo. But we really do need to get going, Kakashi-san. Naruto watched in stunned amazement as Ikigo turned on his heel and proceeded to walk away. 
Karin gave Kakashi a little wave and followed along behind bouncing her soccer ball from foot to foot as she went. It was good see you again, Kakashi-san, said Yuzu with a small bow. Naruto-san, I think Karin wanted to ask you something about Sakura-sensei. Naruto grinned. Sure thing. Why, Kakashi-sensei, leaving his former Jounin instructor behind. Naruto and Yuzu hurried to catch up with the other Kurosaki siblings. Naruto knew that he would pay for walking off and leaving Kakashi with unanswered questions. At least the man wasn't in charge of his instruction anymore. That was Tsunade, who was training him to be the next Hawkage. Karin, what did you want to know about Sekura-chan? I'm an expert. As Karin outlined her need to discuss more specific properties of Kidu healing, Naruto felt a swell of joy in his heart. She wanted his advice. They wanted him to be here. It was like joining Team 7 all over again. He knew that there was trouble on the horizon, but part of him wished days like this could last forever. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 4. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Zionia Aka Disturbed on finfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.